Good afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari on this gloriously warm winter's afternoon here on Juma, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains Game Reserves in the Sabi Sands in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. We are coming to you live right at this moment and exciting stuff is occurring because we just had reports that there is a cheetah somewhere around here and we're going to be keeping our eyes peeled don't often get to see them around Juma, so it's a really exciting event for all of us. I'm pretty sure it's that skittish male. We'll keep our eyes peeled and see if we can't find it for you. And it's not just me having a look around, but it's also the fact that I have Dave on camera. I'm going to send you across to Sam because he has got lions up and moving about. Good afternoon everyone to Safari Live. We have just found two of the males that we saw this morning, part of the Salala breakaways, and they've literally, we're just sitting there and they just turned around and went into the bush there. So they are still there, they're just sitting in a close thicket. So let's see, can we even see a tail there? Can't see the tail at the moment. For the time being, before we go and have a look for them, just want to welcome on board everyone. So the afternoon safari, the sunset safari with Chandra, third drive in a row with Chandra, and your presenter will be Samuel Chevalier from Cape Town. Looking forward to taking you on a nice drive this afternoon. We've just started with lions, two of those males that could be part of the Solala breakaways. So I haven't seen them since I was at London Lozi in my training two years ago. So they were very, very young when I first saw them as a, as a young guide. And now, two years later, they've grown up, they're starting to to get those manes and um, I just saw a brief glimpse of them not a few seconds ago and they've just moved off and got a more quiet a bit of shade there so we're going to see if we can see them again we're going to go slowly we can't actually move into this property because this is Biffelsook so that's Sydney's dam just over there and they've been lying up just next to the dam so we're going to see if we can get another position into another position where we might be able to see these lions. Right, so they were just lying over, over there. The thing is, can my eyes be like binoculars? I need my binoculars. Yeah. You can see a tail, there we go. I can just see the tail there. There we go. So there's the line. There's the tail of the line there. So there's two of them, they're two young males out of there. They're probably around two years old. They've got a beautiful looking mane. And they're just lying up. So lions will rest something like 21 hours a day and, and then they'll only start being active for about three to four hours a day. So this is still hot, hot daylight. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. So they are just sitting up by the watering hole. There we go, now we can see a good visual of them. There's the head, there's the head of the young male line isn't that spectacular oh awesome now he's looking straight at us look at that mane that's beginning to develop with this young male line and an awesome little yawn there that's great i didn't think that we would see him but he's come up to say hello and so he's been resting here the whole day so brent came out this morning we had a fantastic morning we saw well, Brent saw those cubs at, at uh, Cheetah Plains with Inkanyeni and the cubs, and then he came across here and saw these lines on the other side. So we came to see if they're still here, and they are still very, very much sitting up. Well, not in the shade anymore, it looks. They're actually in the sun there. And this is the first time I'm viewing them, so it's really, really exciting. So the chances are they're most likely going to be sitting here lying up for most of the day and then when it gets a little bit darker you might hear them get up and start moving around which would be nice to see potentially they might go for something down by the watering hole but it's been a good afternoon so far we knew that the lions could be but the cheetah there was a cheetah seen on our property not so long ago down by philemon's where jamie is now searching so 
there's even a potential that that cheetah could come up through these thickets to the other side here. Who knows? So there might be an interaction later between a cheetah and a lion. That would be a fascinating thing to see. You can see that the lion is grooming himself there. There he goes. And it's not just him, there's another one of them. And it's really cool to see lions at this age because you just start seeing how they're growing into themselves, developing that mane that will, will start, it starts to grow underneath that chin first and then it starts to grow around the head. There he is, he's looking straight at us now. Cecilia says that she hopes that she, we can see lots of cats prowling around today. Cecilia, it's only the start of drive and we've just come across this magnificent looking young male lion. It's interesting, you know, because they must be part of the breakaway salalas. So the salalas came up here, breakaway salalas, which is I think part of the Mangane, Mangane pride. I posted a thing on my Rewild page on Facebook too, too, that has a story about that, that whole group of lions, that pride of lions. It's super fascinating, the story that is behind them. So, hopefully, if this lion stays here this afternoon, we'll be able to learn a little bit more about what is going on, what are the dynamics of this lion pride, and how are these dynamics starting to influence the dynamics of lions around here? Because we know the Birmingham boys are not so far away. This is part of their territory that this lion is sitting in. And it's a young male lion. So how would those Birmingham boys, how would that dynamic between these young lions and the Birmingham boys be? There's been very, very strange activity between lions lately. When I say strange, we've just seen a lot. You know, we've seen the Inkahumas coming in. The Styx Pride hasn't been so far away. So there's been just a little bit of a, a rever reverberation of the lion dynamics around Juma, Arethusa, Cheetah Plains, and all the other lodges that are around here, all properties. So you can see, oh, there he goes, he's getting up. Wayne has just commented and saying, wow, he is quite young. You can see that he has hardly got a mane. Yes, Wayne, so when they are growing into themselves, so it takes, it takes them to about three years to really mature properly. And so I reckon this line must be around two and a half, coming up to three, and he'll start developing on that main over time. There he goes, he's now up. So he went, he's looking to go and find some shade, I would imagine. Yeah, so it's, it's most common that they will walk through these open areas during the day, find some nice thickets, some shade to, to hide in or to cover up and to conserve that energy. I mean, lions are opportunistic animals, and if there was a, a prey that began to walk along this plain here and walk around here, they would maybe sometimes they would be opportunistic to go for that prey, but most of the time, until they lack, until for 21 hours, late evening around six to seven they'll start getting up and that's when you really see cubs that will come and suckle or, or come and play with each other that's when we see very very active lions is between six and seven when it's in the in the summer coming into winter I'm just talking about the time that we have now because it is going to get dark here by six o'clock it's pitch black by six so what we'll do is we'll spend a little bit more time here with this lion and then we're going to leave this area and see what else we can find this afternoon as we were saying there might be some other prowling cats around the reserve this afternoon. So we're going to go around Juma, see if there's any tracks of any other lions or leopards or anything else really. And we can come back to this line a bit later and see what it's looking like and see if it gets up and what kind of activity it might get up to in the later hours of today. I can't actually see it at the moment. I think he's still there. Let's have a, another look. Uh, I think he's still quite thick under the cover there, so he's not very easy to see. But 
but let's just remember where he was before we leave him here this afternoon. And I know there's going to be a, a, a school with us this afternoon. It's going to be White Oaks Elementary, and so I would love to show them the lions. So let's just remember where we've left the lions so that we can come and have a look. So while we go head off, we're going to head off in this direction, or actually we're going to go up towards Buffelsuk to see if there's any tracks there. We heard a leopard, or we heard alarm calls of a monkey and all sorts around there. So we're going to go and have a look and see what might be lurking around that area. For now, though, let's go and see how Jamie's doing with the cheetah. Look. We have a relatively exciting afternoon already. Uh, before we dashed across to Sam and his lions, I was just letting you know about the cheetah sighting that occurred in the middle of the day between drives. Sam, uh, Sam. Oh, there's Brent. He's also helping us out for the okay. moment. Now, apparently the last tracks disappeared into this block between Zoe's and Rebecca's road. Uh, I'm checking really, really carefully to see if this particular cheetah has popped out or if he's still in the area. And the tricky thing about this particular boy, if indeed it is a boy, could be a female. Stranger things have happened. I have yet to see a female cheetah, but of course they do exist out here. I mean, a female cheetah while I've been working for Safari Live. But they must be around somewhere. And females, of course, compared to the males, have enormous home ranges. So they cover tremendous amounts of ground, almost to the point, you wouldn't call them nomadic exactly, but they, they're pretty close between the two extremes. Uh, there's a good chance it could be a female. I suspect, however, that it is that skittish male that Scott saw all those months ago. And that he is maybe even looking to establish a territory in this particular area. And the two males that we see on Cheetah Plains generally don't tend to move across this far to the west. They do sometimes, but they generally don't. They generally stick around that more eastern area. Well, he might have decided that this is a good place to come and establish himself. Not the best habitat. We do have certain areas that will be absolutely wonderful. So if we have no luck now, what we'll do is we'll return to this area once it gets a little bit cooler this afternoon. Because although cheetah are classified as diurnal, they do move about, most, most of their movement is in the early morning and then just before the sun starts to set and it gets dark. They spend most of the, the hot part of the day hiding out in the shade. I've just realized that I never quite finished introducing myself before Sam's Lines decided to go for a little bit of a wonder. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Jamie and I have Dave on the back with me this afternoon. And we're going to, between the two of us, find whatever wonders we can. I hear that you had a absolutely wonderful morning with Brent and Sam and Kanyeni and her two cubs. I'm very jealous. Just by the way, since it was her that I was tracking, sorry, it was her that I was tracking yesterday morning when I was on Cheetah Plains. She skipped past me onto Nkoro. Hopefully, why did I stop? Something, oh, well that's embarrassing. It's a hyena track, it happens every now and again. When we do have a nice clear hyena track, I might stop and just show you the difference because of all of the big cats, the cheetah and the hyena track probably come closest together or are the easiest to confuse just because you see the claw marks and you instantly, especially when your brain is looking for cheetah, you instantly think cheetah. And it's amazing, so far I've seen at least three cheetah logs and probably about four cheetah bushes. I'm doing well. We've done lots of stopping and reversing. It's the danger of focusing your mind slightly too much on one particular animal. I know that Sam is following up on those alarm calls. If I don't have any luck here, in this area, I'm going to go follow up on alarm calls that I heard towards a little bit further to the east of where I am. I didn't see any tracks coming out, so I dismissed them for the moment. There's always a chance, there's always a chance that the cheetah snuck past and missed its track somewhere. And let's go and see what wonders we can find. Perhaps we can start to start the habituation for this particular leopard. Ah, oh, not leopard, sorry, cheetah. Difference. Since he is quite a, a nervous individual, we'll take things nice and slow if we do find him. 
have been plenty of space. Just like what the way in which Brent approached the nervous male leopard around Bufflesmook Dam, or quite a similar method. Cheetah, of all the animals, though, are probably one of the easiest to habituate. I'm not sure what it is within their personalities. I've spent a lot of time walking cheetah and spent a lot of time with them on foot. And once they get used to the presence of people, they can be absolutely wonderful because unlike a leopard or a lion, it is almost unheard of for a cheetah to attack a person. Uh, very, very rarely, and of course it's rare for, for lions and leopards as well, but cheetah in particular, since they do fall right at the bottom of that predator hierarchy list, they tend to be relatively relaxed. I've only ever been charged, mock, not mock charge, I've only ever had a warning charge from a cheetah once in my life, and that was a very, very wild cheetah, and she was trying to protect her sub-adult cub. And they do this, they have this straight-legged effect going on where they sort of bounce forward and hiss at you. Not quite as intimidating as a lion coming barreling out of the bushes making a noise like a Harley Davidson, but nevertheless a really incredible experience. She then proceeded to disappear and all the commotion in this particular incident, all that commotion brought out a young Dacre baby that had been hiding in the bushes, obviously waiting for mom to return. And this poor little thing got confused by what was going on and started walking towards me, bleating. And the female cheetah that had disappeared suddenly came barreling out of the bushes, grabbed this baby Dacre and disappeared off. And all of this happened within sort of 60 feet of my feet. It was the most incredible sighting. And it was a cheetah, we were up right up near the Botswana-Zimbabwe border. Uh, really truly wild cheetah, cheetah that have hardly ever encountered people in their lives. Leopold, on the subject of whether or not our cheetah is a, a female or a male, you were wondering if male versus female cheetah have, or if cheetah hunt, no, sorry, start that entire sentence again, sorry Leopold. Leopold would like to know, female cheetah hunt as often as the males do, or if they have different hunting roles as in lions? And the answer to that is it's pretty much exactly the same with males and females. The difference is that, in general, it suits a male cheetah to have formed a coalition, so to have more than one involved in that group. And it can be anywhere up to five, even six. And sometimes I think the, the largest recorded coalition that I've heard of was eight male cheetah in a group. That's an unusual situation, but there's usually about two or three of them together. Whereas with female cheetah, they are inevitably solitary unless they have cubs with them. Uh, unless they've got cubs that are moving about with them to help them, very seldom the cubs actually get involved in helping with the hunt, it's more that she brings the prey back to them to teach them how to hunt and how to kill. But for the most part, the only real difference between a male and a female is that the female is a solitary creature, inevitably, invariably. And that's the, the main difference. A cheetah are an interesting animal. The males have much clearer delineated territories and they have regular patrol routes where they, they go and they mark, whereas females will often, as I said, have enormous home ranges where they move about as, as much as they want to, and they go wherever it suits them best. And, where, and it'll be one of the big things that will dominate a cheetah's movement, particularly a female who wants to breed successfully, will be the lion dynamics of an area like that. So if there's a high lion density, if a pride is doing particularly well, You'll probably find the cheetah pushed to the outskirts of that particular pride's territory. They'll try and find a place where there's minimal impact from lions. And that's why potential lion overpopulation, not so much where we are, because we're in an open system, there's four million hectares of wild area to, for the animals to sort themselves out. But in closed systems, an overpopulation of lions automatically has a negative effect on a cheetah population. 
And then, of course, you've got the idea, because of this, the enormous size of the home ranges, cheetahs are one of the only animals where you need more males, percentage-wise, in an area than you do females in order for a successful breeding rate to occur. So far, this male, and I have not found his tracks coming out anywhere, I think that he is hiding from us. Now, even if he is in this block, if he is lying down in the shade somewhere in here, I don't think I'm going to go in to look for him driving off-road. And the reason behind that is I don't want to, particularly if he is a skittish male, I don't want to push him any further. And Hubert, who saw the cheetah, he did say that it was a skittish animal. And we don't really want to go in and make more noise than we have to and disturb the poor thing, particularly if this area is not all that well known to him. I haven't spotted anything. Dave hasn't spotted anything. Not yet. Not yet. Dave remains hopeful. I think what we'll do is we'll go follow up on those alarm calls that I heard earlier and then we'll return to this area once it starts to get a bit cooler. I have a sneaking hunch, it's a hunch, it's not even a suspicion, it's a hunch that he might decide to pop onto quarantine clearings as it starts to get a bit darker. I don't know why I feel that way, but I do. That's what the plan is. So whilst I've driven around seeing nothing, <laughs> Sam has managed to rack up the second of the big five already. Now let's head across and have a look at his elephant. So here we are with an elephant. And it's not a very big elephant. It seems like quite a small elephant this afternoon. So he shouldn't be on his own. I'm sure there must be more elephants around here, but you can see He's browsing, a little bit more active than the lions that we saw now, who was lying up by the watering hole. And it seems this elephant is eating one of its favorite trees there, which is an acacia tree, the one with those big, big looking thorns on it. Did you hear that? How awesome was that sound? Oh, that was incredible. It was really loud. It almost sounded like a bit of a contact call there. It's fascinating. It was very, very loud. So you can see he's quite a young. He must be maybe just around maybe four foot, maybe three to four foot. So he's still quite young. And I'm just looking around to see if there are any other elephants. I can't see any. Maybe there's a whole breeding herd that's still to come. If we sit patiently here with this elephant, we might just see more that comes out of the bushes. There we go. He's got his head right in that bush there. You can see the, see the tusk quite clearly now underneath that tree. There's the tusk. So sometimes the the males, or mostly the males' tusks, are a little bit bigger, a little bit thicker than that of a female. So just judging from a distance here, I think this could be a young little male here. And you can see the wrinkly skin there, that's about three centimeters thick. Very, very thick skin, these elephants. They'll be covering themselves with dust, if you've noticed on the back of this elephant, that is protecting itself from the sunlight, where it gets really, really hot. And it is very hot this afternoon. I think it's around 25 degrees Celsius and 77 Fahrenheit. So in those conditions, these elephants need to try and protect themselves from the sun. So they do that not only by going down to the water to drink some water and covering themselves. So they splash themselves with water and then afterwards they'll throw some dust on them so that that mud, that sand can stick to their bodies and help them give that little bit of a layer that would protect them from those UV rays from the sun. So let's creep a little bit forward and potentially see what we might be able to see. This is just one elephant. We might be able to see a couple more in those bushes ahead of us. Let's creep on. Let's have a look 
and see a little bit more about this elephant. I really can't see any others. Ooh, you can see that there's quite a lot of liquid coming out the side of his gland there by, on his face. So this is a male. It's interesting when they go through these periods. So when young elephant calves grow a little bit older, they then leave the herds sometimes and become solitary males. And then they get these well, they get these hormones that then push, push them and that, it, it changes their whole dynamic sometimes when they start going through mass. But this, it seems that this elephant is still quite young. But you can quite clearly see the secretions that are coming out of this, this elephant here, out of the gland there. Right next to his ear. So that's often a sign of an elephant that is going through a hormonal stage. And that can send different kind of reactions within the body. Sometimes they get a lot of adrenaline when they are in mass. And that can push them to act and behave a lot more differently, especially with the other females that they might come across. But it is fascinating. I don't think I've encountered, well, not often at least, a young elephant like this on its own. He's still very, very, he looks like he's in good shape. He's got a good looking tusks, nice long trunk. His tusks are quite thick and big there. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Have a look at that long trunk. As we see how dexterous those, those trunks are, they can move them around, collect different grasses. So if we're lucky, we'll get to see this elephant not only graze, but also browse. So they're mixed feeders. They both graze on the grasses and, and browse on the trees. There we go. Looks like he just had some grass. Wow, very good. Such beautiful faces, elephants. You can also see those those hairs that are coming out at the bottom there, next to the, next to the trunk. And those are very, they've got a lot of senses, so when the, those little hairs that come out from the mouth there are able to feel everything that they might be touching. But let's continue on. Maybe there'll be a, no, a number of other elephants that could be in the not so far distance. We're on our way to Buffletook Dam. And there may very well be a large breeding herd of buffalo as well as a large breeding herd of elephants that might be looking towards going to those watering holes. It looks like he's starting to move quite quickly now, just before we leave him. There's another elephant down there. I've just spotted the other elephant. So, that's interesting. There we go. So, you see how well camouflaged they can be sometimes. So there's the other elephant that's just over there. So we didn't even see that elephant as we came up, but it was quite stuck in the, the thicket there. And that's going all the way down into the Mawati, into the drainage there, if they continue further down. So this elephant isn't on its own. So let's carry on. Let's go and see maybe if there's anything else out there. It's nice, we've already seen a young, male lion and now we've come across a young male elephant. So let's continue a little bit forward towards Bufflesoak Dam. Maybe we can find some, some buffalo and learn a little bit more about the buffalo this afternoon. We had a huge herd of elephants last night. We must have had about 60 elephants that were moving through this area. It's fascinating because as I said, you know, that dry season that's coming they're going to be experiencing so many new elephants, which will be great to see. So this road that we're on here is Buffelsuk Cut Line. So as we drive down Buffelsuk Cut Line and we have a look for anything that might be lurking in the bushes around, let's go and see how Jamie's doing on the look 
for that cheetah. Well, as Sam ratchets up the big animal sightings, I'm still trying to figure out what these alarm calls are all about. I don't know whether to look to the skies or look to the ground to see what's upset the squirrels and the go-away birds so much that they are continuously calling. Something's also upset a herd of elephants. I heard an elephant trumpeting off in this direction as well. We found most of the herd earlier, just while you were with Sam and his lovely bull. And we will probably be seeing them again once we've done this loop, but I've left them for now just to see what's got everything in this area so upset. In shades of yesterday afternoon, sunset safari, when we spent a good deal of time crisscrossing backwards and forwards to figure out what was upsetting the animals around Galago Pan. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. And we've got something on the ground, which is relatively unusual, if there were a leopard or a lion about. Hello, little monkey. What have you got up your sleeve? Hmm. That discounts most likely discounts the presence of a leopard, at least in this particular spot. Monkey's usually very alert to that sort of thing. And I haven't heard any of the typical <coughs> sounds, alarm calls that a monkey will make. I'm not going to do that again, first of all, because I sound like Donald Duck. And second of all, because I don't want to scare this poor little thing any more than necessary. So that is a vervet monkey called a blow arpy in Afrikaans, a vervet monkey. It's the only real monkey type that we get in this area. There's only two species of monkey within South Africa. That is the Sykes or the Samango monkey and then the vervet monkey. In this area, you'll only see the vervet monkey and then the chakma baboon. We hardly ever get to see the baboons, but we are fortunate enough to see vervet monkeys every now and again. So let's go forward a bit. I don't see any other members of this particular troop. So I wonder where they are. Now he's just down on the ground foraging for seeds, maybe even insect life. Anything that they can find at this point as we go into the dry season will be on the menu. Where on earth did he disappear to? Oh, there. Hmm. A little bit tricky. It's gone into some very, very thick vegetation up off the ground. Let's see, I can't see any of the rest of the troop. Unusual to see them on their own, but not impossible. They live in quite tightly banded family groups. Right, I'm going to leave our monkey since he's no longer visible. I'm going to go see if we can figure out what the alarm calls are going on about. In the meantime, a hornball with Sam. It's got to be quick. So we've just come across across a hornbill that has just swallowed a locust hole. That looks like a hornbill. The hornbill, I'm not sure which hornbill it is. I think it's the, from up here, I can see it is, the, it looks like the red build. Yeah. It's the red build hornbill. But, but it just ate a locust, so that was fascinating. It just, I don't know if you managed to quickly see that, but it just gulped down a, a locust, which is cool. So if you're on the morning safari, you would have seen Steph talking about locusts this morning, and now, You've seen what likes to eat locusts, which are these beautiful looking red billed hornbills. So that was fantastic having a look at that. So it's really, really beautiful to have seen that. And it's, often, it's not often that you get to see animals or birds in particular eating. There we have something else. It is a woodpecker. Awesome. Isn't this lucky? Like, yeah, we... Oh, no, it's not. It's a hornbill. Sorry, I thought I saw it. I thought, I thought it was a, a woodpecker there. It was the same hornbill. 
just looked like it was, this is interesting, what is it doing? Maybe it's gonna collect something else to eat, let's watch. So he's standing on a perch. He could have collected some food, he definitely probably collected that locust down from the ground. Maybe he was just cleaning his beak on top there. There's, oh, this is awesome. Look at that. So we just saw, we just saw one getting, one locust being eaten and now another one comes through. What is it in its mouth? It looks like a butterfly or is it another locust? I think it's another locust. This is fascinating to see this. They just made, yes, it is another locust. So let's watch how this hornbill eats this locust. It'd be interesting to see it might feed it, so it could be a juvenile, this one here. Oh! <laughs> Just took half of that quickly. <laughs> that was very cool. So half of that grasshopper, or well, locust, just got eaten. And I think the other half will get, go back to it. That was such an incredible sighting. Let's see what they do with the other half of this. Is he gonna, is he gonna eat it? Is the, the youngster gonna get it? That was such fascinating behavior to see that. Just broke it in half and then fought for the other half back. But that hornbill on the right there just ate a huge locust on its own. But he's, he's, still, he's still hungry. <laughs> I'm just going to stay quiet for a little bit because I want you to hear the sounds of this hornbill. So they've just flown off. Where are they now? Well, spotted their genre on camera. So it looks like they're still eating it. Looks like they might finish it now. There goes the one. Is he get swallowed down? There we go. There we go. What a fantastic sighting. That was incredible to see this. Looks like they cleaned their beak afterwards there. That was just incredible. Yeah, they are cleaning their beaks. That's exactly what they're doing. So. It all started with one grasshopper being eaten by the one hornbill and then another, another hornbill just came and flew onto the branch and started eating another one. Very, very, very lucky to have spotted that this afternoon. Incredible. So a new viewer whose name is Anne. Welcome, Anne. So this is the red-billed hornbill that we are looking at today. We get a number of other hornbills, so that's your question. You wanted to know what other hornbills we get. We get this one, the red-billed hornbill. We also get the yellow-billed hornbill. We get the grey hornbill. And we get the ground hornbill. Those are the four hornbills we get in this area. And these are the ones that we most frequently see, the red-billed and the yellow-billed. The grey, not as much, but we do still, still see pretty much every, every day we see the grey. But the one that we don't see that often is the ground hornbill. And that almost sounds, the call that a ground hornbill has is almost like a lion. That sound of a lion is really, really incredible. I'm just going to go to the radio quickly because Brent's calling me. Go ahead, Brent. Brent, I'm just driving up with also cut line now towards the dam. Copy will make my way. Thanks, Brent. So, that was truly a fantastic sighting. I haven't seen that before. We were so lucky. First, it, it started with a grasshopper being eaten. And I, f I felt like you just missed it. And then all of a sudden, another one comes and shows it to us. So it had to be seen this afternoon, a grasshopper. 
or rather a locust being eaten by a hornbill. So that was fantastic. We're going to head towards Bifelsuk Dam. Apparently there's another large animal there. It'll be the third of the five, big five, that we're going to be seeing this afternoon. Lynn would like to know, how do you tell the difference between a male and a female hornbill? Lynn, that's a very, very good question. Um, I'm not too sure on how we can tell the difference, but let's actually just get the bird book out because I know that Anne was interested in seeing, you know, well, wanted to know what the four different ones were. So, Anne, if you're still there, let's go to the hornbills and we can have a look if they have any information around sexual dimorphism. So, hornbill. All right. So, these are our hornbills. Let's first go to the one that we just saw which is the Southern Red Billed Hornbill. So I'm just going to quickly read in here and see if there is anything here about female and male. Mm. So there's nothing here that I can see around the difference between a male and a female Southern, bull, southern Red Billed Hornbill. But I'll have a look and research a little bit more around that to help you with that. But this was the southern yellow-billed hornbill. This is the other one for you, Anne, that you, in case you wanted to know. And that was the southern ground hornbill up on the top left there that we very rarely see. And if, uh, I know someone was commenting earlier, they wanted to know what these things meant. This, um, my stepmom also uses this, wo this uh, book and she's seen it in the Okavango, Okavango Delta and in the Kalahari. So that's why we have those. And then finally, the grey, African grey hornbill. So those are the four hornbills we often see here on the property. So we just saw the southern red-billed hornbill that was eating a locust. So what a fantastic sighting that we've had with these hornbills. Montana Steve would, would like to know, could those hornbills that we just saw now be part of a mating pair? You know, Montana Steve, I would have thought that that was a juvenile, a young red-billed hornbill that was then being fed by one of the others, one of the parents of that hornbill. So that's what I would have said, but it could very well have been a female and a male. I think when they get to adults, like when they become adults, they, they will feed for themselves. There's no need for, for them to be fed. So purely because we saw that one hornbill feeding it or giving that locust to the other one, I could. I would imagine that that was the elder one. So that was really, really cool. I've never seen that before, how, how a locust can just get eaten in one full bite. It's very cool. Great, great filming from our cameraman, Jandre. So I just heard, of, heard a report that there might be another large animal down by the watering hole. So we're gonna move in that direction and see what we can find. In the meantime, let's go and see how Jamie's doing. This is exciting news. So, I very determinedly followed up on the alarm calls of the go away birds and I was starting to feel a little bit like I was on some kind of wild goose chase in terms of following up. I couldn't find a single cat track, but I found the reason and unfortunately the reason had wings and thus decided not to stick around in order co to corroborate my story. But it was some kind of bird of prey, quite a small one, almost want to say it was a buzzard of some kind that had caught a again not entirely sure what looked like a franklin it flew off it was on the ground feeding when i came around the corner and it flew off very very rapidly and disappeared into this thick drainage line but that is why the go away birds were frantically calling and dave saw it dave saw it so dave there was a bird right there was a bird of prey there we go we've got a nod from dave Dave, of course, you do realize that you could have thrown me under the bus there spectacularly. Um, <laughs> that being said, of course, then I could drive you into a thorn tree or something. So, so Dave, Dave knows what's sensible. <laughs> oh, yes, I forgot about that, Dave. Dave also once saw a lion that, that left no tracks and actually I think might have been that cheetah, to be honest. I actually think it might have been the cheetah we're looking for. I'm pretty sure it was a lion. All right. 
Dave's convinced it was, he saw a lion, Dave saw a lion that nobody else saw, but both of us saw this, this bird, black and white bird of prey, relatively small, carrying something, clutching something in its talons. Uh, at least I feel like I wasn't following up on a wild goose chase again this afternoon. Yes, it's you. You lot are responsible, thank you, for showing me the light, or at least the bird of prey. I'm not completely mad. There are two grey go-away birds sitting there. Sorry about the antenna, everyone. It's gone slightly skew, thanks to a large branch. There you go, they're still calling off in the distance. Whee! And it's always worth following up on alarm calls like that because you just never know what you might find. And sightings like that, even if it's the briefest moment, the flash of feathers of a bird of prey, are always incredible to witness because it's just part of, it's like one of the tiniest pieces of the dramas that play out every day here. And we focus a lot on the, the big cats and their stories, whether they be lions or leopards, and we spend a lot of time with elephants and buffalo. But there are all kinds of things happening all the time out here. And the go-away birds are bear witness to a great deal of it. And they're still shouting out their alarm. So somewhere in this drainage line, some poor hapless Franklin was caught up in the day-to-day -day drama of life and death out in the bush. Bye, go away, birds. Okay, we go back and see if we can find the herd of elephants on our way to Arethusa. That's the plan now. I'm not... Oh! <laughs> you know, that's interesting. It's one of the reasons why you have got to be so careful when you go walk about on a day like today. Because, especially in a block like this, it's like he's hiding out there. Practically invisible. And if he hadn't moved, I would not have seen him. Hello, boy. I was just wandering about very close to you. I'm glad that we didn't find each other on foot in a surprise manner. Doesn't he look terribly peaceful and comfortable? Oh, ox peckers have arrived. He is so laid back. He is right up in the air. Oh, it is a hot afternoon. It seems to be a good spot to be if you're a buffalo. I'm very, very glad that surprise wasn't waiting for me around the bush that I went walking through. All right, I'm going to stick with this gentleman for too long since we can't see him all that well. Oh, ox picker to the eye. I'm always amazed at a buffalo's tolerance. Oh, <laughs> perhaps not feeling terribly tolerant this afternoon. Anne, a very warm welcome to you as we watch the ox pickers clean out the nasal cavity of this buffalo and around his lips. Seems to be having a great time. Anne is one of our new viewers and is wondering a bit about another bird, the bird that we were looking at earlier, the bird called the grey go-away bird. You're wondering why they're called go-away birds. Well, Anne, it's actually entirely onomatopoeic in terms of the sound that they make. So an alarmed Go away bird basically says, Wah! Go away! Go away! It's a bit of a stretch, but it does sound like that is exactly what they're saying, and they will alarm call at people. And it does I promise you, when you've been walking on your own, sort of through the bush after a while, and a, a go away bird does give away your position, it does very much feel as though they are telling you to go away. Now, I've always known them as grey luries throughout my childhood, but the name has been changed. Doesn't this buffalo just look so happy with life? So comfortable. We never get to look, sorry Anna, got distracted now, but I've never, look at the way he, every time he, he moves his nose to breathe, his lip goes up. Like a, Flemin, like a, a mini Fleming grimace. Every time he closes his nostrils, It 
That's a really interesting reflex. <laughs> I have absolutely no explanation for that. I've never really seen that play out at this sort of angle before. It's like he's pulling faces at us. Really interesting to see the way that those muscles are obviously completely connected and how instinctive that Fleming grimace really is. It's not a full Fleming grimace, but it's sort of like half a Fleming grimace. The Fleming grimace, of course, being that facial position that a lot of mammals adopt when they are when they've exposed themselves to an interesting smell, basically drawing up the top lip. And what that action does is it opens up passages to the organ of Jacobson, which sits at the top of their palate, and allows them to taste the smells that they're experiencing. Interesting. Oh, no, doesn't want that ox picker there anymore. Okay. Bye, Mr. Buffalo. Let's go see if we can't find those elephants again that we were with earlier. So, Anne, the grey go-away bird, I still I can't claim to be a fan of that name. But it is the proper and formal name as recorded in the bird books. So that is what we shall forever after call grey go away birds. And they've obviously given up at alarm calling at our bird of prey. It's such a pity that I couldn't show it to you, but next time, we'll get it next time. It's also stuck. I was quite excited. I, hope, I was hoping that they were calling at the, or alarm calling at the cheetah. Oh, Debbie, just to finish off our discussion on a cheetah, you wanted to know about the coalition dynamics of a male cheetah. Just bear with me one second. So Debbie, you were wondering about male coalitions and whether or not they are as tightly formed as lions or if they will, a cheetah will ever allow an unknown or an unrelated male into their coalition. And the answer to that question is no. Cheetah are actually even more particular about it than lions and there's a very, there's a very good reason for that. In a cheetah coalition, they will always be brothers, or almost always be brothers. They might stretch it to a cousin, just because of the level of close genetic relatedness between them. Now, in a cheetah coalition, there is one dominant male, and only he, generally, will have access to mating rights to a female. So what that means is that the other males in the coalition are invested in the coalition's success purely to promote the breeding rights of their brother. So it makes sense that they want to make sure that if they don't get to pass on their genetics, the male that they help to pass on the genetics of is related to them in some way, so that there is that genetic connection. Lions, on the other hand, are a lot less picky, and whilst there might be some more dominant, less dominant within a coalition, there are more females around, the, female, the males all get a chance to mate, and thus, for them, it makes more sense to not be terribly picky about who they form a coalition with, as long as they have the advantage of numbers. Uh, that's a very brief answer to your question about the dynamics of cheetah versus lion coalitions. Let's find out if, oh, how wonderful. Hmm, I was about to say, let's find out how Sam's trip to Buffleshook is going, but we do have a stunning elephant sighting up ahead of us. In the dust and two boys playing. Hi guys. Hello. Here we go. I did see this elephant herd earlier. I'm so glad that they decided to pop out into the open. Oh, you can see there's a couple of really tiny calves at the back there. And then these in the, the center, the protected center of the herd. And then 
young hormonal bulls practicing their fighting skills. And of course, the ever present call of the go away birds. Still alarm calling at that bird. Oh, and we've got two little babies off to our right who are currently having a fierce tussle. Oh. And of course, without tusks, it's become more of a push and shove game. <laughs> Who's winning here? It's a tight match. <laughs> One poor little elephant who wants to join in the fun, but is just not quite big enough to be involved. <laughs> oh, this is lovely. <laughs> Look at the little bull on the right. Oh, he wants to get involved, but he's just not quite big enough. I love watching elephants play because they can be so like children. Ooh. Whoopsie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> A serious display of power happening here between these Oh, two colossal giants. <laughs> oh dear, it appears to have got slightly too rough. Oh, there's a time to make peace yet. <laughs> there's dust flying everywhere. Trunks entangled. I'm learning how gravity works here with the slope. The one on the right, ever so slightly larger. The one on the left. Oh, snack time. Let's break for snacks. Okay, there you go. <laughs> and back to shoving each other. And of course, your trunk will just have to do when you don't have tusks. A good solid headbutt will so suffice. Oh, somebody's taking advantage. There's a little bull that wants to be involved with mom. I love how indulgently the females watch the antics of the males. Oh, mom's established some order there. Oh, how wonderful. All right, well, since mom has decided to come and put her foot down here in the games before they get too rough and out of hand, then Sam has also encountered an elephant herd heading down for a drink at Buffles Hook. We've got some more elephants and the other one has just come down to get something to drink. There's a hippo there, two young elephants drinking at Buffalo's Hook Dam with a really large hippo. And if we're lucky, we're going to see some sprays from the hippo. We just saw the hippo spraying and these elephants watering each other. You see that? He was blowing some water on his, his brother or sister there. Have a look at them drinking. So they fill it up in their trunks and then pour it into their mouths. Awesome, such a great sight. It's so cool when you come down to a watering hole and you come across elephants running down to get something to, to drink. It's always such a special sighting. And there's not only just these two elephants and a hippo here, there are some big, big buffaloes that are also just to the right here. So we have quite a few animals down by the watering hole this afternoon. where those big dagger boys are. There's two over there that they've been showing a little bit of animosity or getting angry with each other this, this afternoon. I just saw them kind of grunting at each other. So it's just interesting to come and have a look at those two big dagger boys. But let's go back to the wonderful looking elephants that are drinking down by the watering hole. There they are. Looking very, very content to get their afternoon supply of water with a big Big hippo, if you want to take a screenshot of a lovely picture of two elephants in the background of a hippo, it's a very cool shot to see. And I don't think that these, hip these two elephants, oh wow, we just saw spray there from the hippo. So you've got a spraying hippo and drinking elephants. I 
Aaron would like to know, how do we tell the difference between a male and a female elephant? Well, Aaron, we have a look at the, I mean, of course, the genitalia will tell us a lot about whether it's a male or a female. But also, interestingly, when you look at the, the, the tops, the heads of the two different elephants, the, the female elephant is, is known to have a much sharper dome to her, her head. So the male's got a rounded kind of head, and the female has a kind of, like, almost like a, a narrow dome at the front there. But just after we leave these elephants, I'll quickly show you on Elvis the Ellie here, and he'll be able, I'll be able to show you quite a little bit easier how you can tell the difference between male and female, Aaron. And there's a big hippo, and I think that hippo would have also been quite similar to the hippo we saw this morning on Arethusa. Not the same one, of course, but another male, another big male that is holding property in this area. But there we, we've also got two birds there on, on, the, on the shores next to these elephants. You've got a ringneck dove there and also a blacksmith plover that was just walked out of the screen there now. Always oh, fantastic coming. Oh, look at him spraying some water on the water. So it's beautiful lights coming down in the watering hole with these special animals. So we've already seen three of the big five this afternoon. Elephants, buffaloes, and a lion. We saw those two lions down by Sydney's dam that were lying up in the distance. So as I said earlier, elephants will be active for around 16 hours a day, drinking and feeding and moving around the bush felt. And only for around five hours do they rest, and they don't often lie down to rest. Sometimes they'll just stand up underneath a tree and just lie there or just close their eyes and rest. It's not often you get to see them lying down on the ground, and if you see that, it's a privilege, it really is. Look at that. Wow. So it's, it seems that it's just these two elephants, but I'm sure there's going to be some more elephants coming down. Wow, it just had some cool, cool, cool little bit of behavior there from that elephant. He had a little trumpet. But Anna, age six, asked me, do elephants know when it's about to rain? It's a good question, and I, I don't, I don't, um, I'm not too sure of that answer, really. I but I, I think they could. I mean, the pressure changes dramatically out here in the bush when, oh, there's some more elephant, elephants that could be coming. You hear the sound of that trumpeting elephant there? Why, what's going on? I don't know why he's behaving like this. But it's a good question, Anna. Maybe they do know when it's going to rain. And they probably get very, very excited, much like we saw this elephant now getting so excited there. And I know for a fact that elephants do get quite quite excited when they come down to the watering holes to get something to drink. But also fascinating, there's some birds here, if you have a look here, they're the forktail drongos that often follow the elephants. And they're coming down and they're doing a thing called hawking, which means they sit on a tree and they come down and drink down or collect insects on the water. So watch them fly down and collect some insects. You'll see them go in a few seconds. And there goes one. One just jumped down into the water there. There's two now. So it's, it's incredible what they do. They, they stand on a perch and they hawk, they fly down, they collect some insects and they go back to that position. That's very, very cool. There, there he goes. And oh, there comes an, that's, that's another elephant. Look at this elephant. It's just as big. It's not way bigger, actually, than the other two. Look how excited it looks to get something to drink. There it goes into the water to get some nice water. And this buffalo down here is having so much fun in the watering hole. Jeep, is so much is going on down here. Look at him. So the water provides... Oh, there's more elephants coming down to the watering hole. There's just so much going on. Jean-André, sorry about that. There's just He's just moving his camera around because there really is just so much going on. There's elephants coming down to the watering hole. There's a buffalo that's playing in the water. There's, oh, look at them. They're coming to greet each other. 
There's a hippo. Look at the interaction now between these youngsters and the elder. It could be fascinating to watch this. And the hippo is starting to spray, spray out over there. It looks like they've got a little bit of an interaction there between the elephant and the hippo. No. Cheap as there was really a lot going on at the watering hole. There still are birds, there are elephants, and there are buffalo. And so it was just the two youngsters that came down to the watering hole first, and then the others followed. Cheap as they're making me feel quite thirsty over there. them have a nice big drink from that watering hole. You can see this one's quite a bit older than the other two on the left and the right of it. Very, very cool. So you can see clearly now how they can sip that water up and pour it into their mouths. <laughs> Tony's asking how do elephants when they pour the water down their mouth, how do they make it not go down the other pipe? Well, Tony, I think it could be quite similar to us humans where we drink and it just goes down the right pipe automatically. But, I mean, you should have seen me a couple, probably about 30 minutes ago, I was eating an apple and the apple went down the wrong channel in my throat and I was coughing for about 20 minutes. I couldn't go live. So I'm sure that often happens with these elephants over here where sometimes they chew and they close down the right, wrong pipe. But it's a good question, Tony. I would study a little bit more about the anatomy of how, of how, where the food goes down and where the water goes down. It's so cool to see these youngsters with the elder one. What's, what's also quite fascinating is that the drongos who, who often follow these elephant breeding herds are also just sitting. So it's almost like these, those, these birds, the, the drongos, will follow these elephant herds. And when they come down to the watering hole, they go and find their own place after, after the elephants are drinking. And they start feeding on the insects on top of the water and also start bathing. So there's all sorts of things happening at this watering hole. Did you hear that? That's the sound of an elephant making that sound. I'm not sure if you picked up on that. Very cool to see them drinking here. Um, so the, the tusks are still quite big on this one. So is this a male or a female? Could very well be a female. This large one over here. And you can see that on top of the head there, there's quite a dome, like a sharp, narrow look to the top of the head of this elephant here, the big one. So it's, I think it is a female, and I think I can also see, yeah, you, know, you can see that, that kind of narrowness to the top of that head. That's going to tell us that's a female elephant. And it does look like there's some mammary, some mammary glands to that elephant, which is just on the under, there we go. We're going to see the young elephants start eating. Oh my word, we are, are literally having the best afternoon. There are more elephants that are coming down to the watering hole. Isn't this just fantastic? This is one of the best afternoons I've had here at this watering hole. I almost don't know where to look. There's just so much going on. Look at all these elephants come down. Look how excited they are. There's a youngster there. It's been a long day of browsing. Look at the way they walk. Oh, look at that sweet little elephant coming down doesn't have any tusks it's still very oh wow look at this small one there's a tiny tiny elephant to the right oh, wow look how cute this elephant is oh my word that is the cutest little elephant i've ever seen oh wow isn't this special look at how small this little ellie is it's just incredible this is a really really big Really, really, there's a massive elephant just on the background there. You can see, see him walking. 
So what was really fascinating is that we stood here with just one elephant earlier, and both Chandra and I were like, could this only be the only elephant here? And next thing we knew, there were 40 to 50 elephants coming down to the watering hole. So that, and at the moment we've got about 20, but I feel like there could be more. And it's so great when you see these big herds, these big breeding herds of elephants. Can you hear that sound? So this is a moment to take a screenshot. Moments, there's another really small elephant that's coming in. This is just magical. <laughs> Look how excited this little elephant is. So, so excited. There he comes. Let's watch the egg. It just got some water. How deep will he go into the water there? This is incredible. There's, there we go, drinking. So you know, these young elephants don't really know how to use their trunks as well as the elder ones, but you can see it knows, at least it knows how to fill some water up in the trunk and pour it into his mouth. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna get into a position where we might be able to see this a bit better. Gracie, aged eight, is asking, does Alvis like it when we meet these big breeding herds of elephants? I can tell you right now, Alvis is feeling more than excited. But let's just get into a position, Gracie, aged eight, where we get to see all these elephants down here. This is just magical. So I'm just going to reverse there so we can see all the elephants from here all the way around. Awesome, there's the young ones, there's the big ones, the sub adults, there's all of them. And Gracie, I'm sitting here with Elvis the Ellie, and I can tell you that Elvis is very excited. Look at that little bit of water on that young elephant there. Truly, this is a big blessing to sit with so many elephants. So we just came in time for this big breeding herd to come down. And what, what was really, really quite interesting was learning a little bit about how this breeding herd came down here. Hold on, we've, we've got two elephants that look like they're playing in the distance over there. There's quite a little bit of interesting behavior between two young elephants. Beautiful light on these elephants here. They, they were just playing just before they came to get something to drink. So all those elephants that are down here walking away now have pushed off those buffalo that were not so far away. But it's actually, here comes that buffalo. So that buffalo has, has moved away from that big, big breeding herd of elephants that were coming through. So there's that. You can see there's quite a lot of mud on this buffalo. He's been pushed off by these elephants. Both of them are here. But there you have a look. When you're coming back to these elephants, they're starting to throw some dust on them now. There we go. That's awesome. That'll, show, that'll help them. So they would have put some water on them, and now they're going to they're gonna put some dust on them. Sizemon would like to know, do elephants and hippos sometimes come into contact with each other? Yes, of course, they most definitely do, but as you've noticed, well, we've seen there is a hippo in this watering hole that has been very, very relaxed throughout this afternoon. And it's only when they feel threatened in terms of getting pushed out of the watering hole that these hippos will make any noise about it. But at the moment, it's not, not bothering him in the slightest. There's no worries with that hippo down there. But this has just been such a magical sighting. I'm going to move a little bit forward so that this tree isn't in our way. And then we can get to see these elephants down here now, drinking. Ooh, this is even better though. There's elephants playing in the mud. There is just so much to see. It's, 
So have a look at these elephants that are now playing in the mud. This is so special. So exactly where the buffalo were, they chased those buffalo. The buffalo just moved off rather very slowly. They moved off. And these elephants came down and started to play in the mud. Very, very cool. Look at them splashing the mud. So if you want to screenshot some elephants splashing away in the mud here, yeah, please do so. is so great so they're covering themselves this will help them not only protect them from the harsh rays of the sun during the heat of the days but it also i think that to be honest i think they also really enjoy just throwing the mud on themselves and it'll help them with different parasites that jump on their backs it's also a little bit of a bath for them as much as we wouldn't see that because when we throw mud on ourselves we get very we think we get quite dirty it's very cool to see these elephants playing here like this. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Yo, this is incredible. Look at them playing in that mud there. Getting right in there. So there's not only just one of them in there, there's another one just behind the tree that's also throwing mud all over itself. I think, you know, it's so worthwhile to see all of these elephants playing over there. So I'm just going to get in a position maybe where we might be able to see those elephants playing in the mud. These, yes, Shane, these buffaloes have been pushed off. <laughs> So there's still quite a few elephants. There's even more elephants still coming down to the watering hole. If we have a look over there to the left, more elephants there. So they're excited to come down to the water, watering areas. But for now, let's, let's go over here. Oh, there's two of them are having a little bit of a play with the trunks there. One's blowing some dust over themselves. This is worth having a watch. So, so much going on down by the watering hole this afternoon. So they are playing over there. I'm just going to move. All right, yeah, I'm going to sit in this position for a bit longer and just watch what these elephants might do. It'd be worthwhile to watch the interactions of these two elephants here. It looks like, ooh, there we go. So there's, there's also what seems to be a, a young elephant after these guys start to stop playing, because this is fascinating to watch them playing like this. And there's, oh, wow, this is cool. They're just playing. You can just see a bit of the dust coming out behind them there. Oh, it's just so much. Look at that. This is incredible. If you, It's pushing itself. There we go. That elephant just pushed the other one away. And to the left is this small little Ellie over there. That Ellie was just lying on the floor there, which was interesting. There where it might just get back down on the ground while we watch these two fight. There it is, it's on the ground. Sweet, look at that little elephant there. There's so much going on. There we go, these two elephants are still having a little bit of a, just a little bit of conflict. I think that they're just playing with each other though. A little bit of play between the two elephants. It's good bonding, social bonding between them. Oh, this, it all started with one elephant. So next thing you knew, you had elephants playing with each other, young elephants drinking. Look at this. This is so cool. They've got their, they've got their trunks wrapped. They're just rubbing against each other there. Look at this. Oh, it looks like they're just sizing each other up. They both look like they're similar to age. One's reversing off into the water there. Isn't this great to watch? 
There you go, so the one's back now. It's not going back into that water. <laughs> so it could also be a little bit of dominance display between two young males. I was just trying to feel what it's like to have their trunks and their tusks grow bigger. It's a great little interaction between those elephants. It's always, always fascinating to see them. So here, yeah, they've just come across another elephant. So we still have a few, quite a few of the elephants around. Oh, it looks like you just... What's going on here? <laughs> He's kicking. He looked, <laughs> he looked like he was kicking the other elephant there. A judo kick. That was a great little bit of interaction between the elephants. Well, so this has been such a fascinating sighting. Some of a huge breeding herd of elephants that came down to drink some water. Really, really such a special sighting. We're going to see if there's anything else that might happen. But Jamie is out there and she's found another large group of animals. Let's go and see how Jamie is doing this afternoon. We're having something of a breeding herd afternoon on this sunset safari and just to have a look at this tiny little buffalo calf before it disappears. There's quite a few of them in this herd. If I had to guess, I would say that we could well be surrounded by close to 300 buffalo all around us. Uh, we're starting to really see the effects of the dry season starting to take hold. Lots of breeding herd of elephants and lots and lots of buffalo as well moving through this area. I was actually on my way to Arethusa, but I found myself in something of a buffalo roadblock. They just appear to be everywhere, and they just keep streaming out of the bushes in front of me and to the west of me. There's something truly iconic about a large breeding herd of buffalo. We so often see the Duggar boys, or the, the sort of more solitary in the smaller groups of males, but we don't often get to, hello girls, <laughs> encounter the, the large breeding herds like this. And there's, oh, Dave, look at the little one. Sorry, distraction. Another tiny calf, probably only born about a month or two ago. If that, following behind. Imagine how scary and confusing it can be at times to be a buffalo calf of that size, especially in a stampede situation where the buffalo are running away from a lion attack. Imagine being that poor little thing trying to stay together with mom and in a group like this. It must be tremendously scary. Uh, it sounds as though, just listening to the Arethusa Game Drive channel, it sounds as though They've been watching them as well from their side. So this must be an absolutely enormous herd. And as you well know, with buffalo herds, very often behind them comes a pride of lions. We'll have to wait and see if that is the case this time. I'm trying to get a head count, not an entirely accurate head count, just a rough head count. And I think my, my guess of around 300 is probably quite accurate. Most of them seem to be crossing over there. I'm going to go forward just a little bit. Not enough to scare them. Just to go forward a bit and see if we can't get a bit of... Oh, hold on. Got a lovely old cow coming towards us. No big girl. <laughs> and a little calf peeking out from behind another female's legs. I think my, my view of buffalo will be forever changed after the sighting that I had with the Nkuhuma lionesses a couple of months ago, where the lionesses chased the buffalo herd for a long time before catching one of the young calves. And this female came in to try and rescue the calf. 
was the most incredible show of bravery. She came so close to actually becoming their next, their additional meal in her efforts to try and save the little one. And it takes, I mean, you don't really know what goes through a buffalo's head. They don't really give the impression of being the most well defined in terms of intellect. Let's try and put it nicely. And they, in other words, they're not really the brightest sparks, so they certainly don't appear to be. And yet, I'd love to know what went through the cow's head when she set out to defend her calf. Oh, as our breeding herd slowly streams across, Sam's, one of Sam's elephants has gone for a swim in the dam. Sorry, sorry. Isn't, we, this is just incredible. I didn't even know how to start there. This elephant just came and just dipped itself in the watering hole. <laughs> What a pleasure. This has been such an incredible sighting of elephants this afternoon. And look, half his body is full of mud now and water, and they're still playing in the watering areas. Look at this. Wow. You can hear the sound of the tusks as they hit each other. This is such a special sighting. These two elephants have been playing with each other for at least 15 minutes now. Fascinating to watch these juveniles playing. Splashing all over each other, jumping in the mud, kicking, shoving. Wow, look at this. This is a full of little tussle between these elephants. Look at they're still going. <laughs> this, is, this is so cool. And they're still going. I'm just going to stay quiet while we listen to them still hit eat me. You can really hear it when their tusks hit each other. Coming closer, pushing this one further and further back. They lock. It's so cool to see this. Half the body of this elephant is filled with mud. They're still going. It's a little bit of tension. It seems like it's two, two males. And Sarah was just asking, would two females do this? And you wouldn't often see two females fighting like this. It's more between young males that will be playing and hitting each other with their tusks and pushing each other into the water. This one doesn't want to stop playing. He keeps following the other one in whatever direction it goes. So out of the breeding herd while well, they've just gone behind the bushes there. Oh no, they're still going. It's like they're having a little sword fight. <laughs> they are have, having a little sword fight around this watering hole, turning around. No, doesn't want to play anymore. <laughs> They're going back into the water. You can see the water looks still very, very green as they run through it. Look at 
Look at him, he's still going. Look, this is such an incredible thing to see, to see two elephants playing and fighting like this. The tusks are still hitting each other, their trunks are coming interlocked. I've been silent every now and then just to listen to that sound of those tusks hitting each other. sound of those. It's only built and got stronger and stronger this fight between these two elephants. But it's been the same story. The one elephant that's behind this one pushing and it almost seems like it's trying to display a little bit more dominance on this other male. all the way around this watering hole. Just while those are behind there, have a look at this elephant that's walking in front of us. And it's walking right past that hippo there, so we're not, it's not the only two elephants that are here. We still have one elephant that's quite clearly observing what's going on. You can still hear the sound of those two that are fighting, the tusk hitting each other. You can hear the sound of the hornbill between this fight of two young males. It was like, looks like this elephant. This other elephant that we just saw by the watering hole is coming towards those two. So if maybe to settle the fight. It seems like another male. You can hear the sound of trees breaking as they fight in the distance there. Quite a bit of tension between these two elephants. Let's just quickly see if these elephants run out. If they don't run out in the next... You can most certainly hear them. If they don't run out in the next 10 seconds, let's move off to Jamie and see how she's doing with the large breeding herd of buffalo. Oh, but they're still going, they're still fighting. And now you can see trees coming down. It's just so worthwhile watching this fight now move off into these thicker areas now with trees falling down. And it looks like the other one is now moving off here. The other one has just run off into the distance, it sounds like. And it's just trumpeting in anger. You can still hear the trumpeting of one of those. We're still with our buffalo herd that are slowly disappearing off into the bushes and I think this will probably be the last view that we have of them for now. As we sit here for the moment, I do know that we are due to have a school join us on the back of the vehicle. I'm not sure whether or not they have arrived yet or not. We'll just enjoy a little bit of a moment with the buffalo herd. It's not a subtle thing the sound of buffalo moving through the bushes. It's not a quiet animal, as it were, a buffalo herd of a good 300 individuals. Very, very noisy. We're going to try one more time just to reposition so that we can have a better look at them. Just because it really is a lovely large herd. Let's see if we can't get one more view. It does sound as though you've had the most amazing sighting with Sam. Elephants swimming, playing. We've also had a wonderful time. So. We really are fortunate in that winter brings all kinds of opportunities. The ellies aren't too hot to be playful. And they're even a bit warm enough that they want to go for a swim every now and again. Definitely, definitely something very exciting to experience. Uh, pick a general direction, Buffalo Herd. Which way are you going? They're going 
back towards Philemon's cut line. We spoke about the little baby buffalo that we saw and I said it must be a scary experience being a tiny little buffalo in a very, very big herd. And Gracie, you were wondering, what happens if a little buffalo gets lost? Will mommy look for him or her? And the answer is yes, mom definitely will. What will happen is mom will walk around going, Mwah. the contact call that a buffalo makes sounds a little bit like a cow, but just a little bit different. And the calf will also start to call as well. Now you'll try and help mom to find it again. More often than not, it's the amazing thing about buffalo. Each and every buffalo knows and it is imprinted on its mother. They don't get too confused and they find each other once again. Here we go. Wow, this herd is bigger than I realized. There are lots and lots of buffalo here. Here's another baby for us to stop and watch for the moment. So even though the buffalo calves move away from their parents every now and again, away from their mothers every now and again, they're never too far away. And mom's constantly aware of, or at least usually aware, of the position of their youngsters. Sorry guys, I'm just going to listen to the Game Drive channel for one moment. quiet again. The typical breeding season for a buffalo is around January to March, even right extending into April, that you will get new births of calves. This is a little sub-adult male, probably was born last year sometime. At this point, mom could well be pregnant once again and he finds himself all on his own. Hard to believe when you see a buffalo like this, perfect looking with tiny horns, hard to believe that one day he could well grow up to be those, like those huge dugger boys that we see hanging around the pans. Oh, somebody's having a jolly good scratch. It pays to be constantly alert if you're a buffalo in a herd like this. It's always interesting to watch just how jumpy they are as well. Constantly nervous and as soon as one startles, the rest of the herd will follow even before they've established exactly what it is that has scared the other individual of that herd. Oh, don't go looking for milk there little one, you'll get a kick. This big buffalo bull, I've been watching him for a while now, he's casting about looking for any potential mating opportunities he could have with any of the females. Now he's gone up and sniffed each and every female that has been in his vicinity. He even tried to mount one of them earlier. Well, wonderful news. We'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Miss McCown's class at White Oaks Elementary. Hello, my name is Jamie and I sit on the front, I drive the car and I tell you all about the different animals that we see. And then behind me, you're basically looking through the eyes of a gentleman called Dave. So Dave operates the camera, he decides where it is that we look and what it is that we look at. And you've arrived at a perfect time because we have a whole herd of close to 300 buffalo, one of the biggest animals that you can find in Africa. Well, the wonderful thing about being out here and being on the back of our car is that I want you to imagine that you're on a real, live, wild safari. Uh, I hope you've all got everything ready. I want you to pretend you are sitting on the back. Apparently you're all very, very excited. I'm also excited to have you here. I want you to imagine that you're sitting on the back of the vehicle with me. 
nice and hot today, but there's a gentle, cool wind blowing, and it smells. How many of you have ever smelt a cow? Do you know what a cow smells like? Because this is exactly what this currently smells like. We're going to go forward a little bit, and we're going to just see if we can get you a better view, and you can see some of the baby buffalo. Even though they look like cows, they are not cows at all. Uh, while I go forward a little bit, Sam has found another really large animal, and he'd also like to say hello, so let's jump on the back of his vehicle. Welcome to White Oaks Elementary. I hope that all you kids have a fantastic afternoon. We really, really want... Oh, there we've just had... Not only is this a hippopotamus that is in the watering hole, as you can see the hippo has now put its head underneath the water there. That was very, very special. Hippos love water. That is their favorite place to be, is in the watering areas. And we've just had two elephants that came down to the watering hole. So this is really, really exciting. And you've just come for the most exciting part of it as these two elephants here have been fighting for quite some time. It's been a fascinating afternoon. So we are sitting with two of, of the largest animals in Africa. These are the elephants, the two elephants, and the hippopotamus. And these two elephants, as I said, have been boxing or just having a little bit of a fight. So, just as we've started with those animals, I think we should actually have a look and see who's talking to you. It's me, Samuel Chevalier from Wild Earth TV and or Safari Live and working out here with Jandre, the cameraman. We've had a fantastic afternoon and we're so happy to have you kids out with us this afternoon because we've been experiencing so many different elephants. We've been watching elephants fight and there are still two elephants that are fighting here. There's there the two elephants are. So these two elephants have been playing or fighting against each other, making quite a noise. And the hippo that we've just been looking at has just been sitting in this watering hole, not really paying attention to any of the fighting. Asia Lee would like to know how many teeth does a hippo have? It's got quite a number of little teeth, but it's got two major major teeth in the middle there so if we are very very lucky we'll see the hippo open its mouth and you'll see that there's two at the bottom two at the top that are very very big very scary when you see the size of hippo teeth but we can hear the sound of elephants running there we go listen to them they are making quite a noise they've been playing with each other for about half an hour now Can you hear the sound? Kids, can you hear the sound? Wow, he's still with our buffalo. Standing on a termite mound. Aren't they incredible animals? Absolutely enormous. One of these boys, how many of you are there in the classroom? Let me see, are there 20 of you? Are there more than that? We can find out how many there are of you. Even if there were 50 of you, this buffalo would probably weigh more than all of you put together. He's close to 2,000 pounds in weight, just under 2,000 pounds. He's absolutely enormous. And this is just a young male. Now, I said that they kind of look like cows, but they're definitely not. They're totally wild animals. And they can be very dangerous, but not to us and not here in the car. See those big, heavy horns? Those are made of solid bone. But just above his eye there, that's all bone, and that's for the males. That's so that they can fight each other. They often headbutt each other to fight over access to the ladies. There you go. Apparently there's 15 of you in the class at the moment. So even if you all stood all together and stood on a scale, you would still weigh much, much less than this buffalo. He weighs close to, not quite, 
but close to what our car weighs with myself and Dave on the back. Uh, there's an even bigger animal out here and back across to Sam and his elephants. Welcome back kids. So these elephants are still fighting. You can see them. There's branches coming out of the bushes there. He's trumpeting quite loudly. This is possibly one of the bigger elephant fights I've seen in some time. Here comes he's making quite a bit of noise. It's really, really interesting to see these really big animals making such a lot of noise and crashing over bushes. So you could have seen some of those, those branches that were coming off the tree there. That just shows you the strength of an elephant. Rihanna would like to know how much does an elephant weigh? Well, you can get different sizes of elephants, of course, and they can get up to four to five tons. That is a really, really heavy elephant. But these elephants that we're looking at now is probably about one to two tons. They're young males that are having a little bit of, it looks like they're having a little fight. But they've been fighting for quite some time now, which is quite interesting. But here we are with a hippo that's just in front of us. Did you see that water that just spurted out of that hippo over there? Isn't that cool? Jordan would like to know, how does a hippo protect itself from predators? Jordan, if you can see this elephant, I mean this, wow, look at that. Wow, that is amazing. Great filming by Jean Ray managing to catch the yawn of that hippo. That hippo. So just going back to your question, they protect themselves by not only sitting out in these watering holes in the middle of the watering hole, but you saw the size of that mouth there. No animal wants to come across a hippo, especially with the size of that mouth. And you saw the teeth there, as I explained earlier, it's now shown you in a direct experience of that hippo, you saw those big teeth that were in there, the big canines. So that was really, really cool. And what's important to know is that hippos don't actually eat fish. You would think that they would eat fish because they live in water during the day. They actually come out at night time and they feed at night. These elephants are still fighting over here. So let's just quickly go back to those elephants. So as I said, that, that hippo will come out at night time to feed. So it doesn't feed inside the water itself. Whereas these elephants that we are looking at now, will be feeding both day and night on this foliage. But look, at that. wow, is making a big, big noise. It's not happy as you can hear. That was, that was very, very cool. There's so much going down by the watering hole. We were so lucky to see that hippo open its mouth. It's actually the first time I've seen a hippo open it, opening its mouth here on Juma. I've seen it before a couple times, but to see it here was a very, very big privilege. I hope some people managed to get a, you guys managed to get a picture of that or a screenshot on your computers. But kids, here comes another big elephant to the left of us. Here's a much larger elephant, as you can see, it's in the background. This elephant must be around three tons. But you can't see him right now. There's another elephant crashing through there. Marley would like to know how much a hippo weighs. Marley, also a couple tons. Well, this, this hippo that's in the watering hole here must be around two to three tons. A very, very heavy male. And the males will occupy this watering hole. So they, they we're looking at two of the heaviest animals, both the elephant and the hippo which is very cool. Also the buffalo that you've probably just seen with Jamie is with the buffalo. So three of the big five of Africa. We are so lucky to be seeing all of this. And this one elephant that we are about to see now must be one of the bigger ones that we've seen all afternoon. It's a big male elephant. It's got big tusks. Have a look at those tusks. The tusks are those two things coming out by its long trunk there. The whole class is asking, what do elephants eat? Well, they eat all sorts of plant matter. So they'll eat grass and they'll also eat leaves of trees. 
but not only the leaf of a tree they'll eat, they'll also eat some of the branches and eat the cambium layer, which is a little a part of the... Ooh, just listen to that. So they'll also eat the bark, the bark from a tree. So that's what they eat, guys. So there's a lot happening down by the watering hole. The hippo has now submerged its head underneath the water there. It's blowing some bubbles there. This elephant's now coming down towards the watering hole. It's going to get something to drink. Joseph would like to know how long will hippo live in the wild for? Joseph, hippos will, will live for quite some time. Over 20 years hippos can live up to. You can see them as they get a little bit older. You can notice the difference between an old hippo and a young hippo. But they're not very easy to see because you can only really see their whole body during the daytime. You can't really see them. Or, sorry, you can't really see them. You can't see them during the day because they're in the water during the day. At night time, that's when they come out of the watering holes. That's when you can get a good view of them. As you can see, you can just see the top of that hippo over there. So Jaden would like to know, how do elephants make noise? That's a good question, Jaden. Well, let's have a look at this elephant over here. We can't quite see the trunk at the moment, but the trunk is just in front. So let me just show you with Elvis the Ellie, which is my favorite little Ellie that I like to show. This is Elvis. That's the trunk over there of the elephant in the distance, and they make a noise through that trunk. So they blow air through that trunk, and it makes a very, very strong noise. So that is how they make the noise here. We've got some elephants that are now rubbing against a tree, or hitting a tree, rather. I think it could still be those two young males that are having a little bit of a fight. You can see some dust billowing over there. If we're lucky, what are they going to do? They're going to come out into the open areas. Let's see how that might interact with this big elephant that's here. So there's that elephant. You can see it's one leg raised slightly. And that front part of that elephant there is actually the wrist. That is a wrist of an elephant, but here comes the two elephants out of the bushes. Wow. The whole class would like to know how long might a hippo stay submerged underwater? Well, from what I remember reading it, they can go up to two to three minutes being underwater. But I'm not too sure on how long they can actually do that for. That's a very good question, class. I'd love to know the answer. If you know the answer, if you can look it up, see if you know the answer of how long a hippo can be underwater, then you can help me and Jandre, the cameraman out here, to learn something new about the bush out here. I'm not actually so sure how long they can spend time under the water there. It's very cool. But I, I'm guessing they can go probably around two to three minutes. You can still hear the sounds of those elephants. Hmm, Xavier. Xavier is asking, what does an elephant smell like? Xavier, they've got quite an interesting smell, especially because they I mean, they can, they have about two, two to three boluses of dung, which is poo, about every one and a half hours. And it's quite a stinky smell. It's not stinky as in, you know, it's a different, it smells very, very different. And often that smell lingers with the elephant. So that's that smell. So what does it smell like? It smells like really wet grass, really, really, really wet bark grass put together and I mean, you get different types of smells with elephants from a big old male that's in its must, which means it's in its social behavior, trying to attract the females. They, they exert a very, very interesting smell when they're trying to find those females. 
but I can't really explain that, that smell. I almost feel like you guys need to come to this African bush one day and to smell it for yourself. It's a unique smell. It's incredible. So there's something here. Ooh, that's a hornbill. That's a red-billed hornbill. So we can still hear those elephants in the distance, but this is a hornbill that's just eating something off the ground here. This is the second time that I've seen this. Today we saw hornbills eating, and now we can see them on the ground eating. It looks like a juvenile, which means a young hornbill. So if you've ever seen the Lion King, this is otherwise known as Zazu, the hornbill. It's a, it's a very, very beautiful bird that has quite a red beak. You can see it. It's going to probably pick on something. It often eats part of dung. You'll often see them eat elephant dung. Jackson. Jackson would like to know, do elephant tusks grow? Yes, Jackson, elephant tusks do grow. They can grow very, very large indeed. They can grow up to two meters long. So if you're standing in your class, try and line out in your classroom somewhere there, two meters, and imagine those tusks. How big is that? It's incredible how big those tusks can get. Sometimes these elephants, which are making a, still making a very big noise in the distance there, they can come really close to our vehicles, and you have these tusks walking around. It's incredible. Really, Jackson, awesome to see that. So that hippo is still right here. So we have another special African animal for you all to see. Let's head off to Jamie and see how she's doing. A special African animal and one of my favorites, looking at a warthog and a family or a sounder of warthog. Now, how many of you have ever watched The Lion King? If you remember Pumbaa, Pumbaa was a warthog, just like these guys. But uh, having been up close with a warthog before, they don't smell nearly as bad as the Lion King pretends that they do. And I'll tell you a little secret, an amazing secret. If you watch the Lion King and you have a look at the warts on Pumbaa's face, the lumps on his face, Pumbaa only has two. And what that means is that Pumba is actually a girl warthog and not a boy because boy warthogs have four warts, two here on either side close to their eyes and two down here by their mouths. Another thing about it is that those are not actually warts, they are lumps of little like almost like extra bone, kind of like cartilage like your ears, you know how you can kind of move your ears a little bit if you bend them forward? That's what those warts are made of in a warthog and they're there to protect them. I'm going to try and see. Unfortunately, these warthogs are playing a little bit shy. I don't think they want to be on camera this afternoon, so we'll have to creep up nice and quiet and slowly and see if we can't get you a better view. It's also their bedtime, almost their bedtime. They want to be hiding away now as it gets dark. They're going to go back to their homes underneath the ground. Hmm, where did they go? I don't see any warthogs there. Do you see any warthogs, Dave? Nope. You guys spot any warthogs? I can't see any. Gotta look carefully behind all the trees and the leaves. Nope. I think those warthogs have decided to go to bed. Check carefully around. Now, at the moment, I've been talking to some of the other guys that are driving around on this game reserve and they tell me that they found footprints for a male leopard. I'm sure many of you would be really, really excited to see a male leopard out here, but you're going to have to pay close attention and you're going to have to look really carefully because I'm sure most of you know a leopard has spots and a leopard has spots because it means that they hide very, very well, so it camouflages them in amongst the leaves of the trees. So if we're going to spot a leopard, we're going to have to be nice and quiet, and we're also going to have to look really, really carefully as it starts to get dark. But the fact that it is getting dark is perfect for us. As 
we go through here and we look for leopards. You've been watching elephants with Sam. Now elephants are probably my favorite, one of my favorite animals, if not my favorite animal. And you want to know when are elephant babies born? So when, what season is an elephant calf born? And the answer is they don't actually have a strict breeding time. So a mommy elephant can have a baby elephant at any time of the year, but there's usually more elephants born in our summer because there's more rain. And more rain means there's more food for the mommy to eat and therefore the better she can feed her little baby. I'll tell you another amazing thing. You know how if a human being has a baby, they're pregnant for nine months. That's a whole nine months that it takes to create a human baby. Or well, elephants, it's more than twice that. An elephant is pregnant for nearly two years. So it takes an elephant two years to make a baby. Isn't that incredible? Doesn't that seem like a really long time? It's 22 months of a mom's life. Uh, during that time, she's got to feed both herself and her baby. Uh, our warthogs, unfortunately, I was hoping maybe they'd come out on this road, but unfortunately it seems as though it's bedtime for little warthogs. But you will want to know how much does an adult warthog weigh? And a big adult warthog, a really big adult warthog, can be up to 80 kilograms, which is huge. They don't look that big. They're quite short animals. I mean, they only would maybe come up to about my knees, and I'm not a very tall person. Maybe about that tall. If you all stretch out your arm one to the other, that's about as tall as a warthog is. Sorry, Dave, I know that's not very convenient. So, a bit bigger than, a bit taller, just a little bit taller than maybe a bull terrier might be, but they weigh much, much more. So a, an adult male warthog could weigh up to 80 kilograms in pounds for you guys. That is close to 200 pounds, much heavier than all of you, really, really big warthog. And they can also be quite strong, very, very strong. You know those tusks that they have that curve out out of their face? Well, they've also got tusks on the bottom. And those tusks on the bottom are the ones that you need to watch out for because they're really, really sharp. Okay, we're coming around the corner to where these leopard tracks were. But keep your eyes peeled. This is the perfect spot for a leopard to hide. They really like these deep ditches where a where they can hide and be stealthy because the leopard likes to be secretive. So while we search for our leopard and the sun starts to set, let's go back across to Sam so he can tell you the, show you the beautiful view that he has. So kids, we've just had the most incredible time down by the watering hole with all those elephants as well as that hippo that yawned and now we've got an amazing shot of birds flying in between these trees as well as the magnificent African sun that is setting on another day in Africa. So it's been a truly remarkable day and our cameraman Jandre has managed to find the most beautiful shot of this sun going down over the savannah. Wow. Have a look at the different birds as they jump on those trees. That is awesome. There goes some birds off into the distance there. So as much as there's lots of action with animals out here, the sun always brings a very, very peaceful ambience. So it's very, very calming to watch the sun go down, especially behind these beautiful African trees. So that's an incredible, incredible shot of the sun moving down this evening. And let's just think about how cool it was to watch those elephants playing and that hippo yawning 
and we are now off to go and see if we can find some lions that we saw earlier. So hopefully, myself and Jean-Dre will drive down and locate and find you some lions. But in the meantime, let's head off to Jamie and see how Jamie is doing while the sun sets. So while Sam goes off looking for lions, I've found a really incredible tree. And I'm going to jump out so that I can show you it properly. Just unplug myself from all the cables. So this type of tree is called a tamboiti tree. Oh, better check there's nothing hiding behind it before I go wandering off. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you something really interesting. Now, I'm being very careful not to touch this stuff. Okay, we're going to have a close look. Can you see the white stuff on the end there, Dave? Almost. Yeah, there we go. There we go. You see this? This white liquid, it's called latex. And for people, it's really, really poisonous. So we cannot, I don't even want to touch it and touch my eyes. So it's important to remember that whilst some, some plants are really friendly out here, some are really not. And this particular type is absolutely not. It'll make you feel really very sick. But what's amazing is that some animals can actually just eat this plant. It's only people and certain monkeys that it's poisonous to. So I'm going to put, I'm being very careful, and I will wash my hands after I've touched this, but I'm going to put this back. Oh, it's so poisonous that you can't even make a fire using a Tamburti's firewood. People have made fire before and picked up sticks by mistake, and those sticks have turned out to have come from a Tamburti, and it makes them feel incredibly ill. Oops, I forgot that I can't do that, sorry. There's a special order. I can't plug myself in without opening the door first. Important to remember that out here, some trees can be very poisonous. Elephants, on the other hand, absolutely love to eat these trees. And they're really important to the ecosystem. So what they do is they serve a very important purpose in holding soil in place so that the soil doesn't wash away when it rains. And then, if I look carefully somewhere here, I think we're almost at the end of their fruiting season. But we've got other trees that you can actually eat the fruit of if you get hungry. Just like this one, it doesn't have fruit at the moment, but this is a guari bush. And a guari bush is the perfect snack food. I'm going to send you back over to Sam. He's got something interesting. We have just found, found some honey badgers on the show this evening. There, there it is. Awesome. There's two there. There's two honey badgers. I'm going to stop there. Awesome. This is the first time I'm seeing one. Go back, Wait, go back, go back. Let's go back a bit. This is so exciting. There they are. I'm just going to reverse a little bit more. You can see the one in the background walking there. That's one honey badger. That's another there. It looks like it's... It's just running around that termite mound there. Let's go on the fly, right? Let's try to go forward. I'll see if I can see it. Wasn't that? <laughs> that was amazing. That is one of the rarest things you'll ever see in the bush. Let's just go in here quickly. I think they've moved around that term up now. That was, let me just switch off here and wait a few seconds to see if they come back. That was amazing. Two honey badgers. We saw two honey badgers. Now, they are very, very strong animals. A lot of animals are, they wouldn't come across a honey badger because they are quite scary. Guys, honey badgers love honey.
as their name suggests, the honey badger. So there's actually a bird that's called a honey guide that sometimes shows those honey badgers where to go and find honey. I can't stop smiling because I'm so excited to have seen the honey badger. They, they also eat all sorts of things like snakes. They'll they eat a snake. Sometimes a honey badger will even get bitten by a snake and uh, it'll go down and even a venomous snake and then still get up and be able to survive. They are one of the, if not the toughest animal out in the African bush. They've got really strong claws that they're able to dig out. But their forearms, their forefingers are much stronger than their back two, two legs. So they are very, very strong, powerful animals. And they will, they will eat snakes. They will eat all sorts of things. Um, scorpions, which are the ones that have that sting at the back, they'll eat those. So that was just magnificent. We're going to go and see if we can find those honey badgers again. It'll be so worthwhile having another look. Asia Lee would like to know, how, did the honey, how does the honey badger get its name? Well, the honey badger, as, as I just earlier suggested, it comes from that name. So I'm not sure if you get badgers in America. I know you get badgers in, in England, but the honey badger gets its name purely for, for being able to collect honey. So they often go off into the hives, the, the beehives, where they, all that honey is to go and collect honey. So that's where they get their name from. I'm just looking around here. Sometimes birds will give away where an animal is. So we're just looking also at where the birds are. Because they might just give away where those honey badgers have gone to. <laughs> Kids, this is one of the most exciting days of my life. I've only ever seen a honey badger once. And now we saw two. We saw two honey badgers. And we saw it live. <laughs> That's so cool. So let's reverse a little bit more and see if we can see them. It looks like they've just run into the thicket there. And that's sometimes what it's like when you see animals. It's just so quick, especially the rare ones like the honey badger. So it doesn't look like they've come down this far. Let's drive back slowly up the road and maybe, just maybe, it'll link back this way. Let's go back to Jamie and see what she's doing. We're going to drive really slowly and see if we can spot them again. But thanks, thanks so much for being part of this experience. It was awesome. We'll see you just now. That is absolutely amazing. I hope you're all really, really excited about the fact that you got to see a honey badger. You hardly ever get to see them. So that is just one of the best things that could have happened on this sunset safari. Yay! I love honey badgers. They are definitely one of the coolest animals out here. So full of attitude. You can't bully a honey badger. Honey badgers have been known to scare away lions sometimes, even though lions are much, much bigger than them. One of the fiercest creatures in the African bush. I'm very, very glad that Sam got to show them to you. And this is the perfect place and time to be out and about. And yes, you are all absolutely right. Morning and afternoon, dawn and dusk, are the right time to come looking for animals because that's when most animals are moving about. So your daytime animals, they're moving around because it's nice and cool. It's not too hot anymore. And so they can move about happily, but they're also starting to head to bed. And the nocturnal animals are starting to come out to move about in the darkness, whether it's a honey badger or a porcupine or even this leopard that we're currently looking for. I was hoping that I might say that and the leopard would just appear, but I think that was a little bit wishful thinking. So yes, dawn and dusk is the best time. And I have these really great childhood memories when I was little. When my granddad used to wake me up at four o'clock in the morning and we'd drive all the way to the Kruger National Park and we were staying close by, we'd go off and we'd go looking for animals first. And he always used to tell me that first thing in the morning is the best time to be animal spotting. Now let's see if we can't find you something else really interesting and unusual before you have to go about the rest of your school day. I was, before Sam spotted the honey badger, I was telling you all about a leopard's favorite habitat. A 
we're driving in one of a leopard's favorite habitats. Lots of very, very thick vegetation areas where a leopard can creep about and hide away. And I think that the male leopard that we're looking for is a leopard called Tingana. And Tingana is one of the biggest leopards I have ever seen. He's absolutely enormous. He's got a, a huge head and his neck is so thick that it looks like he doesn't have a neck at all. It just kind of looks like his head sits on his shoulders. Beautiful big male and he defends this whole area. He keeps other males away, other big males, and he keeps the females within his territory. And he can have lots of different females. He keeps them and their babies nice and safe. That's the way that a leopard works, all on their own and keeping territories to themselves. Quite a lonely life as a leopard, but they like to be alone. That's their favorite thing. What I need to do is I just need to use the Game Drive channel to get hold of one of my colleagues. Oh, wait, no, I can't do that because otherwise I'll interfere with your broadcast. Mm. So apparently there are tracks of a cheetah. Oh, there we go. We can, can contact him. Oh, hold on. Sam's having a conversation now. So basically what this is... Uh, Brent, apparently you've got Nkonzo there. Sorry, guys. Just talking no, to you. I said, there's Nkonzo heading towards Triple uh, M, and if so, where would you like me to check? Oh, uh, okay, copy. Um, no, heading towards Burbin Open. I haven't picked up on any of them since then. I think he's in the drainage line. Copy, I'll check Triple M uh, around signboard. Copy that, thank you. Okay, so what I was doing there was just making plans with somebody else who works here, whose name is Brent, and he's helping us follow up on the tracks of the leopard. And what we're trying to plan is that I drive along where the tracks were seen and search, and he's going to go ahead to where we think the leopard might go and figure out if maybe he's on the move there and if he's going to pop out somewhere there. That's what I was doing there. It's a great way of planning a safari and making sure that you see as many animals as possible. Unfortunately, no sign of this leopard. And it's getting a little bit cold even here in Africa, it does get a bit chilly at night time in midwinter. Hold on, sorry, I've got to check the, check the ground for footprints. But nope, no sign of him coming through here. Just lots and lots of elephant tracks like the ones that you were watching with Sam. Now here's an interesting story. Hold on a second, I'm going to just change the position of the car ever so slightly. I've just found an, an animal's bedroom, a place where an animal likes to sleep. A, there we go, it's that big open patch of sand there. And this is a wildebeest's home. You can see how all of the ground is all flattened and where he has deposited his dung, so where he's pooped. That's actually his bedroom and that's where he spends a lot of time sleeping either during the day or at night. This I know would belong to a male wildebeest. And a wildebeest is, looks sort of like a type of cow but isn't quite. It's actually a type of antelope which is, an antelope is an African type of deer. Now I'm going to hop out for a second and I'm going to do something kind of gross but I want to show you the type of poo that a wildebeest leaves behind. I'm going to bring it to you. It's, it's very dry. It's actually quite old. 
Now, it's really important to remember that you mustn't touch... Oh, I think there's buffalo hiding somewhere there. There's all kinds of birds flying off them, so you mustn't touch poo unless an adult says that it's okay. But I want to show you the inside of this wildebeest's poo. And you can see what type of stuff it eats. That's kind of gross, but it's also kind of interesting. And that is just grass. But unlike the elephants that you saw with Sam, the wildebeest has four different stomachs. So this grass has passed through four different stomachs before it came out the other end. And that's why it's really nice and well digested and actually quite smooth. That's a bit gross. I know it's a bit gross, but it's a good way of, <laughs> of experiencing the African bush. Well, I'm going to say goodbye to the wonderful class from White Oaks. I hope you had a wonderful time and that you enjoy the rest of your school day. And hopefully we'll catch you again on one of our safaris. Bye-bye, everyone. All right, let us go and possibly look for Tingana. I don't know exactly where those tracks were. It was a message that I was called in or exactly how fresh they were. So far, no sign of them. Ooh. It's been a while since we've sawn. Sawn? Sawn is definitely not a word. Sawn is so, so not a word. Yeah, it's been a while since we have seen. Sorry. Another Game Drive channel update. Yeah, it's just right near the front Oh. Nope, not for us. Outside of our traverse area, I'm not sure which leopard sighting they've just called in. While we're here, it's entirely possible that we could encounter Shadow. Yeah. Now, it's been a long time since I've seen her, so I'm really, really keen on it. This is part of her core territory. Now, Lauren, you were wondering, would Tingana be the father of all of the cubs, or the likely father of all of the cubs in this area? In other words, Shadow, Karula, and Inkanyeni. And the answer is, there is a good chance that he is of Shadow and Karula. Inkanyeni falls slightly outside of his territory, but again, it's not unheard of for a female leopard to leave her territory, as we've seen with Tundi mating with Tingana, when she decides that there is a better mating prospect for her. So, there's a lot of research being conducted into the fact that le female leopards are very clever things. About 70%, close to between 50 and 70% of the leopard cub deaths that we know about are caused by male leopards. And a leopardess acts to counteract that by mating with as many males as she physically, you know, she can within the area. So we'll never know without doing paternity tests, we will never ever know exactly who the father of a leopard cub will be. We can, we can compare genetic likenesses and we can sort of maybe guess at who it might be. And he would, there is a good chance that he is the father of Shadow and Karula's cubs. We've seen him mating with both of them on a couple of different occasions. Now that one thing that we've been participating in recently is every time we see a leopard defecate, so when we know which leopard that is, or if it's an unknown leopard, but particularly when we know which leopard that is, then we go and we collect the scat sample. So we go and collect the, the scat, the poo, and we put it in a vial and we send that off as part of a huge study to Panthera. And Panthera is currently conducting enormous studies into the paternity of different leopard cubs. And it'll be amazing when we do get access and we do get to read those results. And we'll be able to tell exactly who the fathers are of each cubs. I know that Many viewers have suggested that Shambhamalana is the father of Inkanyeni's cubs, which is entirely possible. 
we just don't know and it'll be wonderful to when we have when we do have access to the scientific evidence i'm going to head back towards quarantine and the last ditch hope that maybe that cheetah has popped out there while i do let's find out how sam's amazing day is going So an interesting conversation with Jamie, and now you are back on vehicle with Sam and John Ray, who is, we've just been having the most incredible drive with all of you this afternoon. It's, it's been so fascinating. We've been so lucky and just so privileged to be watching not only hippos opening their mouths super wide to elephants fighting, big breeding herds of elephants drinking, to honey badgers running across the road. Uh, yeah, I will smile for quite some time. What else could possibly happen? I, I don't know. We went to go see if those lions were there. We saw, we saw lions earlier. Chris would like to know, this might be silly, but are honey badgers skunks? No, they're not skunks. We actually don't have any skunks in Africa. They're more in, I think it's around Europe and what's well, Asia and Europe, but we don't have skunks here. We've just got honey badgers and some of the other the other species of polecats and striped weasels. So no skunks. But that that sighting that we had with those honey badgers very rare. And what was interesting, I mean, let's actually what I'll do is I actually drew a picture of a honey badger the other day. Let's just see if I can find it quickly. If I can't, then don't worry. But, as I like to do my pictures, I drew one of a honey badger. Mm. Just give me a minute to see if I can find it because it's worth having a look. Potentially have a look at that moon that's in the thicket there. So there is that beautiful moon. Right, so I do, I do have one picture here, we'll come to it now. Look how incredible this camera is and how good at the filming genre is. You can really pick up all the different things. Look at that. You can see the craters in the moon and the moon is starting to get fuller and fuller. You can just see that there's one last edge left of it over there. I shouldn't be moving when John Ray's in shot like that. It's naughty, Sam. Naughty, <laughs> Sam. But I was trying to get that picture of a honey badger. So I have, this is a terrible one of the honey badger that I did. I actually don't want to even show you that one. It looks like it was done by a little <laughs> No, John Ray. Oh, no. Okay, that was a very quick one that I made. But please excuse it there. Uh, that was... was very good. Very good. <laughs> So anyway, I mean, this was one that I drew very, very quickly. And the, the scientific name of a honey badger is Melivora capensis. And they've got that significant, like, white back over here. So over here, you'll find a white back over here. And <laughs> you're going to have to excuse the face. I mean, that, <laughs> that, is, that is not what... <laughs> it's very embarrassing, actually. I just... Can I take that away, please, John? Okay, right, hold, hold the sauce. <laughs> okay. Screen grabs, everyone. Okay, okay. Thanks very much, John, for embarrassing me in front of everyone there. I have actually drawn another picture of a honey badger, but do you know what's incredible about a honey badger is those front legs because they're able to dig and get into holes and also get into the, into the hives. And with the other picture that I drew, which I'll try and find a bit later, I actually learned that there's... In, in the, um, well, when they go up to go and find these, these, these honeybees, they, they emit a, a secretion out of their anal gland that then stops the bees from biting them and, and stinging them, rather. So how interesting is that, that when those bees are in those big beehives collecting the honey, they release a pheromone, or they release a sec secretion out of that gland, the anal gland, that stops all those bees from, from giving them that sting. So that's really, really fascinating. But I've got that in my notes. And because we've seen a honey badger this evening, I find the one that I enjoyed drawing, drawing the other day, not the one that you just saw. And I'll share that with everyone to learn and something new about a honey badger. So what an experience we just had with that honey badger. 
And we're going to try and get into a position this evening because we've got the camera that really gets good pictures of the moon and the stars and everything like that. So I'm fascinated by stars. Stars is probably the one part of being out in the bush that I love the most, to be, to be wrapped in, in awe because of all the different stars and constellations and all that this evening. So I'm hoping to show you the closest of our stars to this planet, which is Alpha Centauri. Centauri. Cindy from Tennessee is asking, I wonder how common it is to see honey badgers in pairs. Well, interestingly, you actually see them, they, they are solitary most of the time, from what I read, but they're also collecting groups sometimes, groups male of, of, of males that, that sometimes go together. Um, but that is, it's a good question that, of, of how they move together. Of course, when they are mating, the female and the male will be together. So that could very well have been a female and a male that were mating, that were together, that we saw. Because both of them were quite large, her genre, they were quite large. I'm sure you guys will agree with me. So that would very well have been a, a male and feel, female honey badger. But I've got so much to learn about them. I've only ever seen them once before. So I'm excited to do a little bit more research and, and study more about the honey badger and its, and its, uh, its, its, its way of life, really. And it's, uh, the, the scientific name, as I said, is Millivora capensis. Millivora capensis. Aaron from New Zealand. Yes, we have had some incredible luck today. Well, it's been really fascinating because both, you know, John Ray is a very experienced film and photographer out here and it also knows how to get the, the right shots. And together with just going out into the bush and finding things that makes for a good experience. So, so I'm very, very grateful to have Jean Ray on the back who's, who's also been helpful with these experiences that we've had this afternoon. But yes, I would love to find something beautiful out there this evening. Hopefully an owl. I would really like to see an owl. So we've got our, our light on. And bush babies start coming out at this time. So we pay attention, we might just see a bush baby that might be lurking around the bushes somewhere. We could even potentially see some more hyena activity. It's been, it has been a very lucky, lucky afternoon, so I wouldn't be surprised. And no, today has actually been incredible because I saw a jackal this morning. We didn't see it live because we were down by Buffelshoek. And next thing I knew, it was gone. So, so we're going to carry on in this direction and see what we might be able to find. Hopefully, we can find something that's incredible that will bring some more luck to our evening. But let's go and find out how Jamie is doing. Oh. What an absolutely wonderful afternoon Sam has had. I could not be more thrilled for him. It's afternoons like this that really, I mean, you're, there's always the wonder. There's always that sense of wonder whenever you drive around in the bush. But to have a day like Sam has had comes around every now and again and is just so special and refreshing. And that honey badger sighting just sounded absolutely incredible. But to know that we can look forward to more sightings like that in the next few months as we go head into the deepest, darkest, coldest days of our winter season is also an exceptionally exciting prospect. And what I'm doing now, apart from trying to follow up on that, the tracks of that cheetah and just to see if it hasn't popped out somewhere here, obviously because it's a daytime animal, it's a diurnal animal, we won't be spotlighting it, but we could spot its tracks and it might give us a possibility to, as to where to start searching for it in the morning. That being said, this is one of the best roads for nocturnal animals. I've seen porcupine tracks, honey badger tracks, civet, artfark tracks all around here. Uh, that's what we are searching for as we go deeper into our evening. A little bit chilly and of course any lions following that buffalo herd this is a point i completely forgot about i think it was just a daker sorry we're going back a bit it's 
run away. A really, really fantastic question from Ginny in York. Uh, Ginny, and York, by the way, is one of my favorite cities in the UK. I really, really enjoyed York when I paid a visit there. You were wondering why it is that birds will alarm call at a predator like a lion. I mean, a lion clearly isn't really a threat to them, or are they just helping to warn other animals? And it's that's a really good question because it's one that I don't know the exact answer to and it's kind of up to you to make up your mind. And there would have been a time, instinctively, and a, and a leopard of course is a threat to a bird, although very, very seldom will a leopard waste its energy chasing one of the smaller passerines like a go-away bird. But it could be that they don't necessarily identify between the shapes. Personally, I don't entirely buy that as an explanation. I don't think that it's just an instinctive response to a prior threat. I think there is a good chance that they are acting to warn other animals. In the same way that monkeys will go right up to the top of the thinnest branches of a tree away from a leopard and then continue to alarm call even when the leopard has gone past. But then, Julie, you've got another, you've got another situation like the one that we saw with Tingana not terribly long ago where the animal or, or, where Tingana was sleeping completely flat cat he wasn't he barely stirred his head and we had a whole family of guinea fowl walk past and they'd kind of it was almost like short-term memory loss they'd kind of go quack, 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 alarm for a little bit at him and then forget about it and continue to pick at the ground for seeds and then suddenly pick their heads up and start alarm calling again and it was an interesting interplay. Now, we know why they felt so comfortable around him. But because he wasn't exhibiting any predator kind of behavior. And the animals are, you know, they speak a language that is entirely through body language. So they're very, very good at reading the intentions and the actions of an animal. And they will only alarm call when something is showing predatory behavior. Why? Long after that bird, that bird of prey this afternoon had killed something, had killed, I don't know what it had killed, it was some, I think it was a Franklin, I'm fairly certain, it was something feathered either way, and it was on the ground feeding, it was obviously the kill was a little bit too big for it to fly up and to perch itself securely. Why did the go away birds continue to alarm call for a good 45 minutes after that bird of prey made its kill? What provoked that response? Uh, and yes, it's a threat to them still, but they, it's not exhibiting any signs of predatory behavior. So why did they keep calling? Why did they stay in that area and keep calling if not to warn other animals of its presence? I don't have the answers to those questions. It's kind of up to you to, to come up with your own reasons as to what you think. Hello. We come now to a standoff. Hello, boy. A buffalo bull has just loomed up out of the darkness. What do we think, boy? How's this going to end? You can imagine sort of Western style mu music playing now. Oh, I think we won. Here we go. Off he goes. <laughs> I am, of course, joking. There's no way that he was ever going to be a threat to the car. He has now very kindly... Well, are we going... Which, which way do we, would we like to go, boy? Let's take our opportunity now while he's off the road. I don't like pushing animals off the road, especially since it's their home. Hello, boy. Excuse me. And while we talk about the incredible different behaviors of our various animals, Darlene in New Hampshire, you were wondering about, because I mentioned earlier, about the fact that cheetah mums will catch prey and then bring it back still alive to their cubs to help them hone their hunting skills. And you were wondering if lions and leopards will do the same thing. Yes, they've 
all, all three of the big cat species have been recorded doing that. Lions, it's a little bit rarer, just because a lion pride tends to be quite a ravenous thing. So whilst mom, if she's on her own, might have the self-discipline and the self-control to allow the cubs some time spent honing their skills, with the rest of the pride, it's unlikely that she's going to be able to keep them from caving into their appetites almost immediately and start feeding on that particular animal. Leopards definitely do it. I have seen leopards do it in the past. There is that incredible story of Saleyeshe's cub, her current female cub, who's now well over, I think, a year old, who apparently when Saleyeshe caught a daker, the cub then proceeded to kill it at the age of five months old, which is incredible. Because just think about how tiny Karula's cubs are. Oh, and just picture Inkanyeni's cubs. Now imagine them at five months old managing to kill a full-grown daker. Very, very impressive feat from that little cub, especially since she's a female and therefore smaller than a male leopard cub might be. Uh, leopards and cheetah are the main, the predominant species that will exhibit that behavior. And it's quite difficult, I found it quite difficult to watch in the past because the, the bumbling attempts of the cubs you know is all part of the natural cycle of things and you know that they have to learn to do that. But at the same time it's difficult to witness because it automatically prolongs the death of the animal concerned. It is tricky, but then we've also seen Karula do that with a daker without cubs before. She did it before she had her, her, set, her current set of cubs. Where she caught a daker and she left it alive for a considerable period of time before she killed it and started feeding on it. But of course, animals not bound by our moral code. Here we go, we've got another standoff, slightly smaller. Light jar. I don't want to sit with the light on him for too long. I just wanted to show you very quickly. I think it's a fiery necked night jar. They are exceptionally tricky to tell the difference between all of them, but this sort of size and this sort of behavior almost inevitably indicates a fiery neck. They're the most common. Okay, I'm going to take the spotlight off him now just to allow him to fly away. They love the roads and they particularly love the roads in winter time. Here he's gone. It's a great place for flying about unimpeded by trees and catching insects and it's also nice and warm because the roads have been absorbing the heat from the sun all day without shade from trees. Now Aaron's also asked a really brilliant question about why it is that lions have evolved to be have a social structure more like wolves than and so unlike any other cat and it's a, it's an interesting one i mean it's not quite wolves because you don't have that alpha pack system but you you are absolutely correct in that most cats are solitary hunters lions are one of the very few big cat social predators now the best answer and the best theory that I've read about and it's up to you to decide whether or not you completely buy into this or whether you can think of another explanation but it's part of their evolutionary history and lions evolved around the same time as human beings started to develop their, their skills as one of the most well-developed primates and that combined with the structure or the social structure of a hyena clan which is the other dominant nocturnal predator of this area. Now, these, the three species, humans, lions, and hyenas have all evolved together. And it seems as though it worked for lions to be in competition, basically in competition with us as a species and with our ancestors as a species, they basically band together and to form groups as social cats. And that's only a partial explanation. It's one of the big reasons, one of the big explanations behind why it is hyena, uh, not hyenas, sorry, lions have evolved to be nocturnal hunters as opposed to us. We are diurnal predators, we're daytime predators. And the idea is that it kept us from being too much in competition with each other. 
Uh, mostly the theory goes that lions have evolved that way because they evolved at the right time in Africa, which is of course the, the primary spot of evolution, or the initial spot of the evolution of human beings as a species. They've evolved there in competition with us and thus the social structure allowed them to be more successful. I have read other theories about it and it's, it's sort of, obviously it's up to each individual person because we won't ever be able to prove exactly what it is that led to that, why any animal has evolved the social structure that it has. You know, why, why do elephants form the herds that they form, whereas rhino don't, they, they are social creatures, but not really to the same extent. What is it that gave rise to the, the success rate of some species being social and others solitary? I'm trying to remember what the other theory that I read about lions as a social cat was. It was to do with prey abundance and prey size. And it just worked out that in terms of a lion's size and the, what the, the circumstances that we're selecting for the size of a lion versus the size of the prey that they could go after, and how that, those circumstances all interact. But I'm a little bit fuzzy, to be completely honest, on exactly what the particular evolutionary scientist suggested about the social structure of, an elef uh, of a lion. I mean, it's, it's interesting where you've also got that con, oh goodness, what's the word? Help, um, convergent evolution. Convergent evolution where you've got two completely diverse species in geographically separate areas. And let's take the wolf and now let's compare it to the wild dog. And the wild dog is in essence the African wolf to a degree. Their social structure is very similar. A lot of their hunting style is very similar despite having evolved separately and having completely separate circumstances. Oh, hello, Nyala. Sorry, boy. One of those awesome things that we've got two separate species des being designed in a very similar way. Uh, I'm going to leave you to ponder on these great questions. They're questions that vex me every day. Maybe vex is slightly wrong. That, um, that I think about on a very regular basis. And I'll leave it to you to draw your own conclusions. In the meantime, let's find out how Sam's evening is going. So we are back with the moon after a fantastic drive. And we thought that we would just stop and look at that beauty of the moon. It is starting to get fuller and fuller in the sky. You can see some of the dark patches of the moon as well as some of the craters that are quite significant around it. And you can notice it's quite a yellowish, kind of white yellowish glow, this beautiful moon. And we can only see one side of the moon all the time. So we often talk about the dark side of the moon and that's on the other side of this moon. So we're just experiencing the one side of the moon all the time. And if you look clear, carefully, You'll be able to see that rabbit in the moon that we often talk about. Sometimes you have the, you can't, it's not as easy to see, but if you look carefully, you can see that rabbit with the two ears over there. And I love just looking up at the moon whenever I have an opportunity to do so. And it just changes the whole dynamic of the bush out here. You can imagine all the animals wake up to the sound or to the, to the, to the glowing glow of this moon around the bush and it allows for all the animals to wake up and look around. It's, it's an incredible, incredible time. And while we've just sat with the moon, let's go and look at a planet that is out in the solar system. It's one of our closest planets to this, to this Earth. It's red, as you can see over there. If we get nice and close, it's the closest we can get to this planet. And that is Mars. So Mars has quite a red tinge to it, as you can see over there. And that is the red, it's the dust. There's a red dust on Mars that is then being reflected back, all the way back to Earth. So the atmosphere around that planet is quite a lot different to the atmosphere that we have here. We have quite a lot of 
hydrogen and oxygen in this atmosphere. It's an incredible, incredible star out there. And finally, we're going to have a quick look at Alpha Centauri, which is our closest star to this planet. And it's, there it is. So you'll see there, there's Alpha and Beta Centauri. So I think that one over there is Beta Centauri, which is two binary stars, so two stars that are actually follow, going around each other, which is actually the brighter one, and that one's a little bit further away. It just looks brighter because it's two different stars that are orbiting each other. And if you look above it, it is Alpha Centauri, which is part of the pointers of the Southern Cross. So you can't see it as well, but Alpha Centauri, there it is. That's Alpha Centauri, and you can tell it's a star because it's flicking at us. Look at how, do you remember when we were looking at Mars, how it was quite a stable kind of glow? When you're looking at a star, you'll see that it flickers at us, and that's how we tell the difference between a planet and a star. And a planet is a solid mass, whereas a star is a big, big, great ball of gas that is growing. And we have different ages of stars. And the distance of that star to our planet is 4.3 light years away. So the light that we are getting from Alpha Centauri is taking 4.3 years to finally come here. Isn't that incredible when you think about it? How far and how how far these planets are or these stars are around us and that is just one star and that's our closest star and if we wanted to try I mean they've done measurements but the best way to explain the distance is that if we wanted it to get there it would take us 25,000 years by a rocket to get to our closest star Alpha Centauri so isn't that magical to try and understand that a little bit more a little bit more about our solar system and that's just one star and you know, if you go look out in your night sky and you go and have a look at Scorpio, Scorpio in southern Africa is starting to come up across the eastern horizon this evening, whereas Orion is setting on that side, on our western boundaries over there. And in both of those stars are two, or both of those constellations are two red giants. And those are two stars that are getting to the end of its life. So they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and they start emitting almost like a reddish color and that is towards the end of, of of a star's life and when that star finally gets bigger and bigger it will explode but sometimes that explosion will take millions of years just to get to our to our eyes so some of these stars could have already blown up already we just haven't seen it and that's what's the, that's so magical when you start thinking about how big the universe is and how big everything else is out there so it's a special thing when you start listening and looking at all the different planets out there and when, when a planet like a red giant does blow up, it, it turns into a super, so that's a supernova. So that song, song by Oasis, Champagne Supernova. <laughs> Sorry, that's the only way that I really learn about it. <laughs> and <laughs> and that, that's, that's so, so that supernova will then eventually turn into a black hole. And then new, new stars will form. And that, that's endless, endless learning when you talk about that. The, the atmospheres, the galaxies, everything that's up there. And I'm fascinated by astronomy and I can't wait to talk more about it with you. But it's been a great game drive this afternoon. We've seen so much. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you, jean -Ray. jean -Ray, behind the camera. You've been awesome. I've enjoyed it as well, just as much. And we are very thankful for all the viewers to be with us already for so long doing this drive. And we'll see you tomorrow for the sun, sun, sunrise safari. Let's go and see how Jamie's doing. And so we come to the end of another glorious afternoon spent in the African bush with so many magical wonders and mysteries for us. Aaron's question has got me doing some serious thinking at the moment. So I'm, that's what I've been doing while you've been looking at the beautiful night sky with Sam. It's just thinking of all of the different and amazing ways in which this place continues to astound us. And I think my favorite thing about it is that I will never ever, none of us, will ever have all of the answers at our fingertips. It's a journey of almost constant discovery. And even then, it's still going to hold multiple mysteries where different people will have different opinions about what is actually going on and the way in which and the reasons why things happen.
and I think that is probably one of the most exciting things about working in, an, in a wilderness area such as this. The mystery of it makes it all the more exciting. I have a mystery for all of you. Why, at the start of Game Drive, where the monkeys shouting furiously around Galago Pan, you'll have to stay tuned to the Juma Dam and see whether or not we missed a leopard wandering about there. That would be something highly entertaining. It's been a while since we've seen Tangana. Mvula was last seen around Cheetah Plains. Actually, we just, just missed him the other day. But he's been wandering all over the show, so there's always a chance of a surprise appearance from him. And even as we come to the end of the sunset safari, there's a chance of a surprise white-tailed mongoose sighting or something along those lines. I'm looking forward to the full moon over the next few days and I think with that camera if you were viewing the night sky with from Sam's perspective is going to the scenery is going to get more and more incredible. As we wait for the nocturnal mysteries to start unfolding. Hopefully some lions decide to pay us a visit tonight. They decide to come walking past Inga's house and calling in the darkness because there's no better feeling than lying safely tucked up in your bed and hearing lions calling right outside your bedroom window. Looks as though there's some Eddies having a drink at the pan. Oh, looks as though there's an elephant in front of me. Looks as though there's a lot of Eddies in front of me. What a lovely way to finish off our safari. Oh, I can't really spotlight them too much. They don't enjoy it very much, so I'm just going to keep a little low level of light on them. I love a peaceful evening elephant sighting as they make their way across to the Juma Dam for a quick drink before moving off into the night. It's just lovely to sit and listen to the sounds of an elephant herd moving all around you. And I've inadvertently bumbled right into the middle of the herd. You can hear them moving off to the right, to the left, just all around us. Cracking of branches. <laughs> and of course, the gentle release of the digestive gases that always accompanies an elephant herd sighting. Well, it might not be lions outside my bedroom window tonight, but I think that a herd of elephants is probably highly likely. guests at the lodge. It's the lights that you can see in the distance. They're also going to be going to bed with the sounds of the elephants feeding and occasionally trumpeting. That's awesome. What a wonderful way to end off our sunset safari. So we come now to the end. Thank you very much, Dave for all of your fantastic camera work, as well as to Lou and to Jerry and Final Control, and most importantly, to all of you across the globe for sending through your questions and your comments and for joining us on the largest safari vehicle on Earth. I'm going to go sidling past this elephant herd on my way home. Hopefully they decide to be kind enough to let me through, and then we'll be ready to join you once again on the Sunrise Safari. Have a wonderful day, and we'll catch you tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>